Even Lovecraft wrote about the madness and terrors that go on in the mountains. Today, I've got a big old compilation for you featuring the most terrifying and unexplained things that are seen in the mountains. So the next time you get your hiking gear ready and you start your ascent, make sure to bring a very buff friend. And if he's handsome too, well, that's a plus for sure. But buff is the primary goal here. If he can arm wrestle a Bigfoot, you'll probably be just fine. Enjoy these stories and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org. Be sure to check out eeriecast.com for even more scary podcasts. Now, let's begin. During our honeymoon in the Smoky Mountains, my husband and I caught the attention of something unknown and terrifying for an entire week. From Reddit user Wolf underscore Dream. Trigger warning for suicide. About a month ago, a user by the name of Sniper6407 asked if anyone had ever had strange experiences in southern Tennessee and a few other nearby places, particularly in the mountains. I had too much going on to respond at the time, but my husband and I had an experience there that I think is worth telling, although most in our family don't know, because we understand how they would react, so we've never told them. While I realize this post relates many over-the-top experiences, my husband and I both experienced the following as described. I understand that not everyone will believe me, but since this post also contains deeply personal moments in my life, I ask that you please keep comments respectful, whatever opinions you express on the matter. Thank you. This story needs background to convey some factors that were potentially involved. I suspect the events leading up to the trip to Tennessee may have had a direct relation to the severity of the phenomenon we experienced while there. I had never wanted to marry, neither had my now husband. Then we met each other, and we were engaged at 30 and 28 years old. We had a two-year engagement. We wanted our wedding to symbolize our true soul bond and decided to go completely non-traditional. His giant family wanted a white dress Catholic wedding, so we were at major odds with the family from day one. My fiancé and I began suffering from a huge run of exceptionally bad luck and some odd poltergeist activity at home. Nothing too major, so we brushed it off. Except when we left the house once and came back to find a red clown nose sitting front and center on our bathroom sink. No one had the keys to our place and we didn't own a darn clown nose. That one was freaky. When I told a friend something weird was going on to the point I almost felt the wedding was cursed, he tried to explain it away. I replied, Watch, something's going to happen today while he's getting his tux, I'm telling you. I get one flabbergasted look before my fiancé immediately called to say there'd been a freak accident in the parking lot while he was getting fitted for his tux and someone had totaled the back end of his truck. That shut my friend right up. Another glitch was my refusal to have my father walk me down the aisle. I also refused a random stand-in for tradition's sake. I asked my younger brother to walk me down the aisle and he said he would be so honored. We'd had some problems, but he'd been clean for seven years and we'd made up our differences. Losing our middle brother to a drunk driver had driven us apart for a while but brought us back closer a little later down the road. Then, 40 days before the wedding, unintentionally, my brother committed suicide in his mid-twenties. My fiancé and I drove over 16 hours close to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to say goodbye. I knew my brother, and I knew he would not cross over easily with what he'd done, especially with my wedding around the corner and me counting on him. This really bothered me. His viewing was closed to immediate family only. He was not embalmed due to the complete autopsy required. He was covered in a handmade quilt to his chin. We were instructed not to touch him, 
although we ignored this stricture. After saying our goodbyes, I walked to the end of his gurney and lay my hands on his feet, a supplicant. I told him I understood it was an accident, and I forgave him. I told him that if he still felt he needed to make amends with me, then he could do so by calling forth my loved ones and those of my fiance to come witness the wedding from the other side. I bade him bring our other brother, my fiance's sister, grandparents, aunts, friends, and I began calling by name all those beloved souls whom had already passed. Do this, I told him, and there will be no debt between us, and you can rest in peace. The looks on my family's faces were priceless at this point, but I felt this was something I needed to offer. I had a pendant made when I returned to New Orleans. On it was my favorite picture of my two brothers. I wrapped this around my bouquet, and although it seemed to the wedding guests that I walked the aisle alone, I knew that both my sweet brothers were right beside me in spirit, because they would never miss the wedding of their sister, especially with Hector, the one who committed suicide, actively dragging them across the veil to fulfill his last obligation to the living. Later on, my new husband, Eli, and I went to a rental cabin on Bluff Mountain for a honeymoon week. I don't want to name the specific cabin in case I'm not supposed to, but I will say it was very rocky with a raccoon theme. Bluff Mountain is in Pigeon Forge, outside of Gatlinburg in the Smoky Mountains. I was living in New Orleans and had brought a double handful of fresh-picked gardenia blossoms with me. It was a type of symbolic offering to the mountain for having us on such a special occasion. No rituals or anything, I simply arranged them on a wooden box with a fake bird and nest that was sitting on the top of the railing of the cabin porch and sent up feelings of gratitude and joy. We went out to eat and grab groceries. Upon arriving back at the cabin, the wooden bird box had been smashed into a million pieces on the porch. It hit the ground hard enough to shatter so far and so thoroughly. We thought that maybe a raccoon or bear had done it. Then I noticed that there were no flowers. Maybe the wind. Leaves that had been scattered all over the porch, just like when we left, made me hesitate. Gardenias aren't super light flowers, definitely heavier than the leaves I saw. More curious than anything, I looked all around the porch, stairs, and walkway. I shrugged it off until the next morning, when I went a little way down the driveway to pick some honeysuckle. About 20 feet from the porch, I glanced down and did a double take. There lay my gardenias, all of them. They had been piled up and squished flat as crepes. There were no shoe prints, but it took more than one stomp to flatten the pile like that. Unnerved, I walked away wondering if the mountain didn't like my offering after all, then laughed at myself for the thought. Night 1 Eli woke up suddenly to what sounded like something big banging the support beams under the cabin. The cabin hung off the side of a hill, so the front half was supported about 15 feet off the forest floor by giant wooden posts. They were being hit so hard that the mirror on the wall was vibrating, which, frankly, should be physically impossible for anyone to do. Eli said every time he started to drift back off, there was another bang. He gets up, fully, and after one more cabin-shaking bang, he decides to wake me. Apparently, he was trying to see if I would wake from the banging, so he would know he wasn't dreaming. But now he was 100% up, as he reached for me, he said the loudest bang or slap came from the area between the sitting area slash kitchen right at the bottom of the bed. It was a one-room cabin. He said it sounded like a giant book getting dropped from high up, but he was looking right there, and there was nothing. This bang was definitely inside the cabin. He began frantically trying to wake me, but he said I was so deeply asleep he actually thought something was wrong with me. He said he could barely tell I was breathing. Then, this strange metallic jangling sounded from behind the TV, directly across the cabin from our bed. 
He said it went on forever, but he was too scared to go look for whatever it was over there next to the huge windows past the spot where the noise originated from inside. It was this insistent buzzing that finally woke me. I remember it was so hard to come back to consciousness. I felt like I was literally swimming through blackness to get back to myself. I kept asking what the heck is that noise? I thought it was an alarm someone left set. Cute. When I finally woke up enough to move and set up to go find and smash the offending noisemaker, the trilling stopped. Groaning, I fell backwards onto my pillow. Eli began telling me about the banging. I could tell how upset my husband was. I believed what he was telling me, but I was so numb and out of it, I was struggling to come up with any emotional response at all. There was only this debilitating fatigue, and I fell asleep on my husband when he needed me, when a man whom I'd never seen afraid in seven years was completely terrified, I just zonked out until morning. Normally, I'm an extremely light sleeper, especially in new places. This trip, however, almost every night was like this. No sooner did I put my head on the pillow than I was swallowed by blackness. It was extremely deep sleep, but it wasn't restful. Waking up was worse. It was like falling into a coma every night and slowly reviving every morning. It ironically left me exhausted. Day and night too. While doing my makeup in the infamous shaking mirror the next morning, I was able to get the full story and talk to Eli about it logically. Maybe a bear was rubbing against the post. He replies, it was solid bangs like a huge fist. No way a bear. And what about the one from the center of the floor on the inside? That reminded me of that stupid alarm. I told him that I was about to disable that thing. At the exact freaking second I mentioned it, that darn noise started blaring from behind the TV again. We both jumped like rabbits and laughed nervously. Heck of a way to time it, I joked. Punny. Looking behind the TV, I was surprised to see it wasn't an alarm clock, but a landline phone. An old one with a bell buzzer, which explained the horrid noise. Of course, I had to answer it. There was a minute of silence, then bursts of static. It really sounded like someone was talking, but static was obscuring their words. I told them to move to get better reception, then asked if this was cabin management. The silence garbled talk continued for a while before I hung up. I was amused, honestly, especially with the way Eli was gaping at me. When I hung up, he immediately unplugged the phone, said management had both our cells, so it was probably a prank call from someone who stayed here before, but we were not going to play along and end up in a deliverance scenario. Smart man. Phone stayed unplugged for the duration. That night we were in the hot tub on the deck. It was around the back, had a gazebo type cover around three sides, and no lights too close, so bugs wouldn't be swarming you. As we're relaxing, I'm sitting on the open end, facing the enclosing wooden strips, and Eli's facing me in the forest. I kept admiring the blue light behind the enclosed end. It was large, about the size of a cantaloupe, and seemed bright. But the glow over us in the hot tub was very muted. I figured it must be LED of some sort but I'd never seen a light that shade of blue anywhere. All the other lights in and around the cabin were bright and orangey, so I remember saying how it was sweet. They went all out for mood lighting for the hot tub. Eli both looked at and commented on the light as well. When we decided to get out for the night, the light blinked on and off in what looked like a purposeful sequence before shining a few more seconds and going dark. We commented that it was strange how the light burnt out like that, and how we were sad to lose our mood lighting. I decided to call the next morning for a bulb. When I woke up, I first walked around the rear of the cabin to see what type of pole or other fixture was the one we needed surfaced. But 
There was no pole, no fixture, no other light source behind the hot tub, no cables, no wires. The main office later confirmed the instability of the soil back there prevented anything that wasn't heavy duty from being installed, so no lighting was ever put back there. Whatever that light was, we both saw it, and it was apparently just eavesdropping, because we were out there about two hours, and so was it. And if it wasn't turning off or burning out, that means it was straight up disappearing. Starting the second night after coming in, my skin started to crawl and every hair on my body stood on end every time I passed the open bathroom. The bathroom was next to the bed area. Lying in bed, you could see the bathroom sink and the small window above it. The window had no curtains as it faced into the woods behind the hot tub. At this point, I still thought the blue light was man-made, yet I could swear there was something looking in the window. I'd been leaving the bathroom door open because I liked looking out at the forest from the bed. But now I tried to keep it shut without Eli noticing I was being weird. Eli told me the next morning that every time he began to drift off, a resounding bang on the posts under the cabin would jolt him. He said he was freaked out because no matter how long or short a time he waited to lay his head down, it was like whatever it was knew exactly what he was doing, even though he never got out of bed. Once again, he was wide awake and terrified, and nothing he could do would rouse me even the slightest. Night 3 After scrubbing ourselves as best we could in the highly stinky sulfuric water of the cabin, we were getting ready for bed. Walking from the bathroom to the bed, I realized I forgot to shut the bathroom door. Since Eli was already lying in bed looking at me, I just kept on toward my side of the bed, telling myself to stop being ridiculous. Even though I could swear at that moment, something was looking in that window. I'd already looked out several times and couldn't see anything out of place, but I could still feel it. Eli quietly asks me if I can shut the door. Why? Because that window gives me the creeps. Talk about validation. That night I had some disturbing dreams, but I can't remember them. Eli, however, suffered a severe bout of sleep paralysis that night, although he swore it wasn't sleep paralysis because he says he sat up, kicked, and yelled at her. Now, however, he says it probably was sleep paralysis. Either way, he woke up to eerie laughter and saw what he described as a grudge-type woman standing at the end of the bed, laughing at him. I wouldn't wake. He said she wore a white dress, had pale skin, black eyes, and a horrible mouth. She had long black hair partially obscuring her face and was surrounded by a swirling black mist. She reached for him, and he sat up, yanking his legs up to his chest. This is when he started yelling at her to get out, and kicking at her. Laughing, she faded out. He said he was awakened by her grabbing his ankles and giggling throughout the night, and would also wake just long enough to catch glimpses of her. I was still no help. Night 4 A repeat sleep paralysis experience for Eli, but he said it was even more intense this time. Same lady in white. I had also realized a trinket I brought for luck and put on the shelf next to my side of the bed was missing. It was a tiny cabin, and we tore it up looking for the next two days, but I've never seen it again. It was worthless except for personal reasons, and no valuables were missing, so I don't think someone came in and snagged it. Night 5 Whenever I sat up out of the water on the side of the hot tub, I started to get the same feeling of being watched I'd felt from the bathroom window. I would literally break out in goosebumps. It was Friday, and we could hear a group of, educated guess here, college kids, partying hard some distance out, 
but close enough to hear their screams, whoops, and cheers. Not wanting to give an intrepid, wood-savvy creeper a show, we went in. Not much else happened on night five, but troubled sleep. At one point, Eli woke to frenzied banging on a support post, but it didn't last long or repeat. Night six, final. This was an extra night we received due to the piercingly sulfuric water in the cabin. The filters needed replaced, and so they comped us a night. The water wasn't dangerous, just really, really stinky, like eau de la terre de la rotten egg, bad. And although our nights were weird, we were on our honeymoon and had just been through a tragedy. We spent our days having massive amounts of fun and doing so many awesome things, plus eating great food and drinking the good wine for dinner. Gatlinburg is an amazing place to visit. It was our last night in the hot tub. It was wonderful. Until I began to feel that intense regard from the tree line for the second night in a row. This time it was worse. I could actually feel the ill intent in this gaze. Whenever I came up to cool off, I literally found myself unconsciously wrapping my arms around myself and slipping slowly back down into the water. I reminded my new husband how many years he'd known me and asked how many times he'd known me to be scared or paranoid. I tell him, there is absolutely something aggressive in the tree line looking at me, and it is not a college kid. We could hear them again that night. He scooted over, and I moved to the covered end with him. Within five minutes of me moving, we hear a tremendous crashing from the brush behind us, and then something big stomping around directly below us. This is followed a few seconds later by more crashing and a second pair of footsteps stomping around. They sounded like human steps, but no one could make such a loud noise on the packed earth below the raised deck and cabin. We jumped up and booked it inside, soaking wet. Eli said that night was the worst for the banging. He said there was banging on at least three widely separated posts, and it went on all night. He said when they did let him sleep, the woman would come. I slept like the dead, though, unresponsive to everything. Morning of day seven, leaving day. Something was demanding my attention, pulling me back towards consciousness. At first, I thought it was the mounted police or one of the mule-pulled carriages that sometimes passed my place. No, this was definitely a whole plethora of horses. Was there a parade I didn't know about? Slowly, I remembered I wasn't in New Orleans, and although what I was hearing sounded like hooves, there were no paved roads anywhere near me at the moment, just the small gravel driveway out front. Quickly snapping awake, I realized the sound was coming from the roof. I checked my phone. It was a few minutes after 8 a.m., I groaned. Why the heck would nobody tell the roofers that the cabin was booked until 11 a.m.? I looked over at Eli. He was pale and breathing very slowly. I half-heartedly poked him a few times, but he was out. Ruefully, I thought of all he'd been dealing with while I slept as deeply as he seemed to be now and left him alone. I'd been with him nearly a decade at this point and he had never spoken of things like this before. Whatever had been going on, he deserved sleep. At least it was roofers in the sunny morning and not weird crap at 4 a.m. At this point, it crossed my mind to wonder what roofers worked on Sundays. I listened closer. It definitely sounded slightly metallic, but I decided my initial impression held. It sounded like a horse was kicking the crap out of the cabin roof. Well, what the heck do I know about roofing equipment anyway? I'd have to ask them to stop until we checked out. I pulled back the covers and swung my legs off the bed. The instant my feet touched the floor, the pounding on the roof stopped dead, and the handle to the main door, which was about three to four steps in front of me, started jiggling violently. Two things. There was no pause between the noises. They went from on the roof 
slightly towards the opposite side of the cabin above where Eli was sleeping, to the doorknob in front of me without a time delay. Also, the top half of the door was glass with a sheer curtain, which the sun was shining directly through. I could plainly see that no one was near the door. Yet, I could also see the handle rattling wildly. I yanked my feet up and dove under the blankets up to my chin like a kid. I'm ashamed to say. As soon as my feet left the floor, the doorknob stopped rattling, and the incessant pounding on the roof resumed in the same spot, again with no pause between them during the switch. I'm now staring at Eli, wondering if I should wake him. I'm scared I won't be able to, but I'm also just as scared he'll wake up and won't hear it at all. His eyelids flutter open, taking the decision out of my hands. I ask him if he hears that and thank all the gods he says yes. I'm hesitant to talk about the door when he just opened his eyes, so we talk about what it sounds like first. He also immediately goes to roofers. I ask if that sounds like a hammer to him and he says no, actually. We agree that it does sound like hooves or something slightly softer than metal. This whole time I realized we've automatically been whispering and this pounding just keeps going on and on. Looking around the cabin, we see the mirror shaking, glasses in the kitchen area rattling, the cabinets quaking. Whatever was on the roof shook the walls of the cabin repeatedly. The pounding lasted about 35 minutes, because I checked my phone right when it woke me, and right after it stopped, from about 8.02 a.m. to 8.36 a.m., although I'm not sure how long it'd been going on before it woke me. It was loud and strong and absolutely terrifying. We lay whispering for a time. No way was this a person or people. We started thinking, whatever it was, was trying to bust in through the roof, although the glass doors would surely have been easier to get through. When Eli said he was getting up to look, I told him about the doorknob shaking when I tried to get up. After a brief hesitation, he threw back his covers and sat up. The pounding stopped. He and I both froze. A terrible grating noise sliding on the roof broke the silence. We both looked at each other with big eyes and pale faces. Was that Claus? I hissed in the quietest voice I could manage. He leapt back up onto the bed, and the banging resumed. The quietest discussion ever followed about if we had really just heard claws up there. We thought it was exactly the sound huge claws would make, but really it could still be anything. Eli grabbed his legally owned firearm from his bedside drawer before quickly standing. The pounding stopped for a second to allow for another grinding rasp to sound across the roof. That is definitely freaking claws, I said. The pounding immediately resumed, twice as fast and even harder if that were possible. I could now feel the thumps reverberating through the bed. Eli told me to stay inside and listen. Whatever it was, it sounded huge, and he needed me to let him know what direction I heard it move in if it ran out of his view up there. He burst out the door and aimed his gun at the roof. The pounding stopped. There was absolute silence. There was no sound of running anywhere on the roof, and the roof didn't have a darn thing on it. In addition, being perched on the side of the hill as the cabin was with no trees nearby, there was nowhere anything up there could have gone. We packed at mock speed, but did have one last smoke in the driveway to help with the shaking and nerves. It was open, so it seemed relatively safe. While we smoked, we could hear the people who had been partying the last few nights. They were all out yelling for a missing friend. We heard them yelling about the last time they saw him, which was apparently the night before. We could hear their panic as they screamed his name over and over. Eli and I tried to find the group to help look and ask if they had seen or heard anything weird. However, the winding one-way dirt roads were confusing, and we ended up lost. We actually think they may have been locals, and we couldn't get to them because we were on rental cabin roads, 
which don't connect to local roads and driveways for obvious reasons. I really hope they found him passed out drunk in a bush somewhere. I regret not being able to locate them and help them look. I have no idea what this was. Nearly every major paranormal MO showed up. From orbs, weird calls, and poltergeist activity, to cryptid type goings on, and the lady in white. Yet it all really did seem like one thing in different outfits, if you will. After coming home, we had no more weird activity at the time. I did request for the departed to stand witness from a deceased brother who owed me a favor, but I specifically requested only the blessed dead, and only for the wedding ceremony. This didn't seem like protective ancestors to me though, so I don't think it was necessarily related. I actually lean towards some type of nature or elemental type guardian spirit personally, but that is just conjecture. Even though he said differently at the time, Eli now thinks it was a Bigfoot, although I think not. If you made it this far, thank you for your time and listening to my oh-so-memorable honeymoon. Any ideas on what we may have encountered are welcome. I'd love to hear what everyone thinks. Thank you, and best wishes. The Case of Dennis Martin This story is not a submission. It is a documented and tragic event that occurred in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Dennis Martin was a six-year-old boy. He and his family went on what was supposed to be a pleasant outing to the most popular national park in America, that of the Great Smoky Mountains. It was Father's Day weekend in 1969, the perfect time for a traditional family camping trip for the Martins. Together, they hiked from Cades Cove to Russell Field and camped overnight. The day after, they hiked to Spence Field near the Appalachian Trail. Once there, they planned to stay the night. Now, young Dennis Martin had allegedly been planning on surprising the adults of his family with his brother and some other children. His father last saw him going behind a bush to hide and wait for the proper moment to surprise everyone. Well, Dennis Martin was never seen alive again. Several minutes later, after the rest of the children had already returned to camp, Dennis's father went looking for him, searching the trail for nearly two miles, only stopping when he was completely sure that the boy couldn't have gone further. Searching for hours more, the family then received help from the National Park Service rangers but, as mysteriously happens with high frequency in missing person cases, a sudden downpour came down on the area. About three inches of rain poured over the land in just a few hours, washing out trails and bringing nearby streams to a flood. The temperature also dropped to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus began the most extensive search and rescue effort in the park's history, even today. The search covered 56 square miles utilizing the efforts of around 1,400 people, which included the National Guard and Special Forces. The day after the disappearance, the rains gave way to a deep mist, further limiting search efforts. Footprints were found but were determined as being those of a Boy Scout who had participated in the search. These footprints, though, did lead to a stream before disappearing, and, stranger yet, the footprints indicated that one of the feet was barefoot, and yet none of the Boy Scout searchers were barefoot. This assumption was now brought into question. A shoe and sock were later found as well. Sadly, the search was called off after a failure to find much else. By June 29th, the search was abandoned. Dennis's father, desperate to find his son, offered a $5,000 reward for information on the whereabouts of his boy. That would be over $35,000 today. Still, no new information was found. Years later, a ginseng hunter claimed to stumble upon the skeletal remains of a child. Unfortunately, ginseng hunting was illegal. Therefore, he refused to approach authorities with the information or whereabouts of the remains fearing that he would be charged. That's the end of Dennis Martin's tale. 
Several theories arose as to what may have happened to the poor boy, but one in particular stuck with the boy's father above all others, the theory that Dennis was taken by someone or something. You see, on the afternoon Dennis disappeared, a tourist by the name of Harold Key, along with his family, reportedly heard an enormous sickening scream, and soon thereafter witnessed a disheveled-looking man run up the trail near the origin of the scream before he escaped into a white car. Other sources say the man had been attempting to hide himself behind a thicket and seemed to be carrying something over his shoulder. What happened to Dennis Martin? We may never know, but what we do know now is that national parks and deep, vast forests are beautiful places that must be tread carefully. Keep close attention to the ones you love and never be the last in line. The Mountain Road from Jacob I live in the Great Smoky Mountains in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There are a ton of black bears here, and I've seen so many of them. I know what they look like, and I'm saying that for a reason. Now, I live on the side of a mountain, and our landlord lives up the mountain about a mile away. I used to love walking up that road, so I wouldn't mind walking our rent up there to his house, until one day last week. It was daytime, so I was calm and felt fine. I started my regular walk up the hill until on the walk back I felt this strange sensation. I don't know why, but I decided to turn around, and when I did, I saw something that I couldn't believe. This odd animal. It was big and black and on all fours, and my first thought was, it's just a bear, I'll be fine, until I really looked closer. I realized the two front arms were longer and bigger than the back. Then, even though I couldn't make out any facial features, I noticed it had a flat face. Now, being a little freaked out, I picked up my pace and was jerking my head to look behind me and in front of me, with only a second at most in between. I still don't know what I saw, and I hope never to find out. I know it's only been a week, and I know it was a very quick experience but I have not taken a step outside since then, except when I'm with another person. Anyone know what this strange creature or misshapen bear could have been? Werewolf or Dogman Encounter From Anonymous I won't state my name for confidential reasons, but I've lived in rural forests all my life. This story took place in two locations within five to ten miles of each other, and it happened to me and two other friends of mine. My friends live in one of the most rural areas surrounded by farmland, forest, and the Appalachian Mountains. We were doing things normal people do when they hang out, but as soon as the night fell, the mood changed drastically. I felt as if I was being watched, it was just the beginning of the night and we started to hear this knocking sound at the back of the house. My friend told me not to worry about it, so we tried to take our minds off of this, but the sound got louder. Three consistent knocks turned into bangs. My friend had soon fallen asleep, but I couldn't. All of a sudden, I found myself peering outside of a small window. This window was almost ten feet off the ground from outside. My curiosity soon turned to horror as a massive animal turned the corner of the house. This animal had long ears, ragged hair, and some human-like features only visible by the dim night sky. The one feature that stood out to me was its eyes. These large glowing yellow eyes with hardly a pupil in sight gazed back at me. I was paralyzed with fear. With nothing to do, I tried to wake my friend, but to no avail. After what seemed like an eternity, I finally just walked away from the window, ignoring it and trying to sleep. The next morning, I told my friend what I'd seen. He didn't want to believe me, but eventually I convinced him I was telling the truth. Nothing else happened during my stay. The weekend went on normally, and I left, not telling anyone else 
as I didn't want to be seen as a liar. This next encounter happened after my friends had moved houses, almost two years after the first encounter. I'd arrived at their house, my second visit there. My friend had recently told me he had seen something dark and big and beastly looking. We had planned to catch sight of this creature again, but we had no luck. One night, in the dead of night, we were outside, trying our luck again at finding it. It seemed a bit ironic that there was a full moon out. We then heard a howl that sounded like it was a wolf mixed with a man's scream. The look on my friend's face then was like no other. This friend was a skilled hunter, and the way he looked was as if he had never heard this before. My friends also lived beside a cattle field, so when the howl pierced the air, the cows started to go berserk. We joked about it and tried to play it off, but even so, we were scared. As we were heading back inside, those eyes appeared in the dark. The moon's light shined on its body. I could make out more of its features then from where we stood. It was hunched over, still seven feet tall in that position, with sharp, jagged teeth, those same pointy ears, and what appeared to be a canine-like head on a man's body. I urged my friend to get inside fast, but still haven't told him why I freaked out. I haven't told anyone about this encounter, but I think what I saw was something straight from a horror film. Bear Beast of the Appalachian Mountains From Doug This story takes place in southwest Pennsylvania, roughly 40 miles north of the West Virginia border. I'm an avid outdoorsman and love spending time in nature when I'm not working. But one recent terrifying camping trip changed the way I look at the world we live in and what hides in the shadows. This happened in mid-April of 2020. I was out of work due to the crisis going on and decided it was a good time to go camping since it was relatively nice out. So I phoned up two good friends of mine to go camping on some state land in the Appalachian Mountains for a weekend. We'll call them Ron and Jake. On that day, we drove out to the most remote area we could find in the mountains. We parked my SUV, unloaded our tents and other camping gear, and hiked a few miles deep into the uncharted Appalachian Mountain wilderness. In case you're wondering, all three of us were carrying firearms for protection. We soon found a small clearing in the dense forest, a perfect spot to set up camp. But we did all notice some large scratch marks on some of the trees about seven feet off the ground. Of course, we didn't think much of it, as it was about an hour before dark, and we needed to set up our tents, gather firewood, and get a fire going. After that, we sat around the campfire drinking a few beers, listening to music, and retelling some old stories. By around 11 p.m., we all decided to call it a night. When we turned off the music playing on my Bluetooth speaker, we realized the forest had gone completely silent. How long it had been like that, I don't know. All three of us knew this was very odd, but we tried not to focus on it too much. We just climbed into our tents and tried to get some sleep. I awoke some time later to an overwhelming feeling of dread. Something inside me was begging me to get out of there, to leave. And the forest was still silent. Until that silence was broken by Jake screaming not too far away, followed by some gunshots and a very deep, loud, guttural roar. This was like a grizzly bear roar, but far deeper, if you could imagine that. I bursted from my tent along with Ron, now completely sobered up. We had our guns ready. We'd been asleep long enough that the fire had died down quite a bit, but there was enough light there to light up the campsite. Suddenly, Jake came sprinting back into the campsite with his gun drawn, completely pale white and looking absolutely terrified. He yelled at Ron and I to just run, that it was coming. Ron and I were still trying to comprehend what was even happening, but what I saw next will haunt me till the day I die. There walking up to the edge of the campsite on four legs, illuminated by the dwindling light of the campfire, was a giant, hulking beast. It looked like a grizzly bear on steroids, dark brown fur, extremely muscular body, glowing red eyes, 
and the detail that showed us it really wasn't a normal bear, or a bear at all, were the large curled horns on top of its head. This bear-looking creature began to growl and bare its teeth at us. When it stood up on its back legs, it easily towered over us at nine feet tall or so. The intense standoff was then broken by rapid gunshots by Ron. This snapped Jake and I from our petrification. We joined Ron in the fight with our guns. I'm not sure how many times we hit the beast, but eventually it did let out an agonizing pain-filled roar and dropped onto its stomach. The thing was definitely not dead. It was alive and growling, but momentarily paralyzed. I guess we'd pummeled it hard enough with our bullets to buy time, which allowed Ron, Jake, and I to sprint like heck out of there in the direction we'd come from. After a few minutes of running, we could hear not far behind us huge crashing footsteps and thick branches breaking. How neither one of us guys didn't trip and fall while trying to navigate our way through the dark Appalachian mountain forest while sprinting and being chased by some giant bear beast, I don't know, but it's an absolute miracle. Eventually, we did make it back to my SUV, and thank God I had my keys in my pocket. All three of us, completely out of breath, scrambled inside as I started up the SUV, that beast right behind us. I threw it in drive and stepped on the gas, speeding us all out of there. A few miles down the road, I had to slow down and puke out the window, due to the fear, anxiety, and exhaustion. The car ride back home after that was completely silent. It wasn't until the next day all three of us spoke to each other about that terrifying event. Jake said he had woke up later that night with the urge to pee really bad. He had gotten out of his tent and walked away from the campsite when we were sleeping to relieve himself. He said he heard loud crashing footsteps coming towards him in the campsite, so he drew his gun and soon he was face to face with the bear beast. That's when Ron and I heard Jake screaming and firing his gun. And well, you already know the rest. We never went back to that spot to retrieve our belongings, and I'm sure what we did leave behind was torn to shreds anyway by that creature. Be aware if you're near or in the Appalachian Mountains. Stay alert at night. There are strange, terrifying things undiscovered to mankind that live within those mountains. Lavender Silence from Anonymous The following story is told without exaggeration or embellishment. These events happened exactly as I'm about to describe them here. I would swear to all of this on a Bible under oath in a court of law. None of the following is fictionalized, just facts. However, the names and location have been changed, although I can divulge the general area where this happened along the Appalachian Trail. I think I'm finally writing this down as some sort of self-help therapy, because I believe I have some PTSD from it. It's always in the back of my mind, and even now I think of it at least once a day, every day. For background information, I don't think that all religious people are crazy. I was raised going to church every Sunday when I was a kid, and I met good, genuine people who were well-balanced and sane. They practiced what they preached, fed the hungry, clothed the poor, and tried to live what they believed. These kinds of people are not the sort I'll talk about in this story. For reasons I won't go into here because it would take too long to explain, my family switched churches when I was about 13 or 14 years old. This new church was of the same denomination, but was a little more charismatic for lack of a better term. Bear in mind that this was also during the mid-1980s, when the Satanic Panic era was in full swing. People began to see Satan in everything, from toys to logos to rock music. So yeah, I went through the whole burn all your rock albums and only listen to Christian rock phase. What a laugh. If only I'd known then what I know now about some of those bands. But that's a whole different story. The short version is, a lot of them were phonies. Now, I only mention the satanic panic thing because it seemed to give rise to an influx of strange people that would come into some of these newer churches and claim to have the gift of discernment. They would say things to you like, the Lord told me that this is wrong, or you need to get that out of your life. 
I had one woman tell me that I had sinful homosexual tendencies because I liked men with long hair. Does that make any sense to anybody out there? I'm a girl, but because I liked long hair on men, I guess she thought I liked women instead of men? How does that make any logical sense? Anyway, you can see what I was dealing with. There were plenty of preachers on TV back then who claimed to have these gifts as well. I'm sure you've heard all about the TV preacher scandals and such from that time period, but there were also these off-kilter churchwomen who did things like this as well. I saw several in this church and tried to steer clear of them as best I could. These women never looked happy or joyful, like the Sunday school and Bible school teachers I remembered from childhood. Nope, no smiling faces to greet you at the door or patiently read from the children's Bible to all the kids gathered in a circle for story time. No, these women were only concerned with what was deemed satanic for that particular week. Woe unto you if you happened to be into whatever band or movie they were ranting about. They just looked angry or judgmental all the time and made me anxious and uneasy. This church attracted some personality types I wish now I had never been exposed to. It was like a magnet for them. While the majority of the congregation was made up of what you could call normal sorts, there were several individuals who eventually made me afraid whenever I sat foot inside any church door from then on. In time, it went beyond anxiety to outright fear. To this day, I'm never at ease in any church setting. On the few occasions I do go, my anxiety is through the roof. I sit in the back in the last row. I don't like people behind me and I'm always close to an exit door. If the church is very large with a huge crowd, all that means to me is that there are just more whacked out people to look out for and avoid. I was a young 17 year old when this incident happened. I'd gotten used to some weirdos that had either stumbled into this church themselves, off the street, or had been invited by well-meaning people trying to save their souls. We had it all. Drug addicts, alcoholics, and several touchy-feely men. Probable predators who always wanted hugs from the young kids, and maybe boys too, for all I know. The preacher was always telling us to hug the person next to you, usually at the opening of the service. Even after several complaints from teens and parents about inappropriate hugging going on, this was still practiced nearly every Sunday morning. To this day, I don't understand why it was allowed to continue. I began to develop an intense dislike of anyone other than my family members touching or hugging me, to the point that I didn't even like to shake hands with strangers. I quickly learned who to avoid at all costs. All of these creepy huggers were men, I don't think any of the creepy women were after a cheap thrill, but these strange women were disturbing enough in their own ways. They would give long-winded testimonies during service, taking up time that was supposed to be reserved for music or the preacher's sermon. As I mentioned before, for the first time in my life, I began to dread getting up on Sunday morning due to having to dodge the predator men and having to duck out the door before the service actually ended, so as to avoid these crazy women. I never got much out of the service at all, trying to keep my eyes on, I'd say about nine individuals, but none of them were as off-putting as a woman named Vicky. From the first time I saw Vicky, even before she ever spoke to me, and before I ever stood close to her or anything like that, I knew something was wrong. Now that I'm older, I know what these instincts are, that I was detecting an energy around people that's actually a warning sign probably a buried survival instinct of some sort, long watered down in our now civilized human brains, similar to an animal's ability to sense these things. If only I'd paid attention to the faint alarm bells going off in my head back then. But I was young and not yet in tune with my ability to sense this stuff. And after all, it had been drilled into us since we were toddlers, to love and accept everyone no matter what. You know, we're all sinners and all that. What I couldn't figure out, and what still puzzles me now, is how quickly this chick moved in to the church, and within just a few weeks was singing solos in the choir, participating in the service, and even teaching Sunday school. Yes, I had the misfortune of being in one of her classes, but only one or two times. I seem to remember getting transferred to a different class, thank God. And of course, she made fast friends with the other spiritual women, 
gladly joining in when they would discuss all the satanic panic stuff. I don't know who she had initially come visiting with, but they must have been influential in getting her ensconced in a hurry. She claimed to have had past trouble with anorexia and had been healed from it. She looked like a skeleton though, but I thought, okay, maybe she just hasn't gained all the weight back yet. As for her singing, it's not like she couldn't carry a tune, but she was singing solos nearly every Sunday, telling her anorexia story along with it, again and again, Instead of finding this testimony spiritually uplifting, I got the feeling that she was somehow trying to emulate singer Karen Carpenter's story, maybe living some twisted, vicarious version of her tragic life. It was just plain weird, and she didn't have Carpenter's voice, that was for sure. No mellow, low voice. This woman was a soprano. This will be an important fact to remember later in the story. Anyway, this gradual takeover of sorts continued for several months, one incident affected me personally, because even though I was careful to not have much contact with this woman, I could not avoid it entirely. I would also occasionally sing solos during service. I was so young and naive then. You know how it is. Everyone tells you you have a lovely voice. You should use it or God will take it away from you. And my parents were involved with church music all their lives, so everyone expected me to follow in their footsteps. I cringe now when I think of standing up there on the stage singing. So one Sunday morning, I finished my solo, and at the end of the service, here came Vicky walking to the front of the line of people who had gathered to say, your song was beautiful, or other general compliments. I saw her approaching, but I could do nothing but stand there and deal with it. I couldn't just run out. That would have looked weird in that crowd of people. She got up to me, hugged me of course, and said something like, I song, but you and I should get together and talk about your diction. For those of you who don't know, diction is the same thing as enunciation, singing the lyrics clearly. My first thought was, look woman, I'm not getting together anywhere with you, chaperoned or not, to discuss anything. I was really put off after that, because for one thing, this woman didn't know me or anything about me, and for another, her statement wasn't a compliment at all and she had said it not too quietly in this large group of people. I don't mind constructive criticism, but she could have said this in a different setting. But on the other hand, I didn't want to be in any sort of setting with her. I don't remember what I said after that, or if I said anything at all, probably just nodded and moved on. I also never sang in that church again after that. Then came the youth retreat, and as you may have already guessed, Vicky volunteered to come along as a youth counselor. I'll note here that I had some bad experiences on youth retreats in the past. On one youth retreat, one of the young men in our group broke his leg and had to be taken away in an ambulance. And on another trip, several years before that, some guy in a non-church camping group down the way in the next cabin fell 80 feet to his death when he leaned over the edge of a cliff to throw up from being drunk. So it wasn't always fun and games and singing kumbaya around the campfire. If I'd had the wisdom and outright second sight that I have now, I never would have gone to this retreat. The problem is, when you're still under your parents' roof at 17, you had to abide by their rules. Being at church and church functions every time the door was open was one of the rules. This included just about all youth activities, which was supposed to be a substitute for any worldly functions which might result in hanging with the wrong crowd. Looking back, I would have rather hung out with my pothead friends at high school than go on this trip. My non-churched friends were cool with me. They knew I didn't drink or smoke, and they couldn't have cared less. We bonded over art and music, most of which I had to listen to covertly, of course. And peer pressure was something we laughed at, as we watched it dramatized in health class films and after school TV specials. I was, in every sense of the word, scared straight. If someone offered me a drink or drugs, I did a very simple thing. I looked them straight in the eye and told them I was afraid. It worked every time. I wouldn't engage in any activity if there was the slightest possibility that I'd throw up. Because I hated being sick. Still do. That's all there was to it. That's what kept me on the straight and narrow, not any religious teaching. And my friends, who were some of the heaviest drug users in the school, totally got it. We got along just fine. Later in life, I'd be their designated driver several times. 
I am digressing here, but my point is this. Tell the truth. If I'd told my parents the truth, that I was afraid to go on any more church youth retreats, and that I thought I was pushing my luck regarding bad incidences that had happened on them, they might have balked me at first. But ultimately, I think they would have let me stay home. They might have seen that their child was truly afraid. Then again, maybe not. In the end, I didn't say anything. Even though I had a terrible sense of foreboding, I kept my mouth shut. But I didn't want to go. I had this intense, though vague, premonition that I could not shake off. It was late summer, August, and I only had a week or so before school started back up, and I wanted to just stay home and relax before starting my senior year. As the day to depart for the trip drew near, I resigned to make the best of it, taking my old Super 8mm movie camera. Video cameras had been around for a while by then, but I still liked the look of actual film so I would save what little money I had to buy the increasingly expensive little three-minute rolls of film. If nothing else, it would be a distraction. I could film some nature trails and maybe some of the other teens. After all, a few of them were friends of mine. From here on out in this story, I can only remember pieces of what happened, and only a portion of it will be in chronological order. The things I do remember are vivid, but if I tried to fill in the gaps, it would turn into fiction in those parts and I don't want to do that. I want to tell the absolute truth with no drama or exaggeration. I think because of the trauma I experienced, it's impossible for me to remember some things. It's taken me a long time to get to the point of writing this down at all, and the next paragraphs will be the hardest I've ever written. The anxiety and PTSD are just that bad. My hands are shaking slightly as I write this, for starters, I don't remember hearing or knowing that Vicky was in fact coming on the trip. She seemed to just show up later on the second evening. I don't even remember her being at the church when we left. I don't even remember whose car I rode in to get to the place. If we'd taken a church van, I don't remember riding in it. I must have ridden in one of the counselor's cars. We'd been in this location about two years before on a different retreat with no bad incidents, so I don't think my premonitory fear had anything to do with the location itself. However, since the location was on the Appalachian Trail, well, anything's possible. This area of the US has had plenty of evil things happen within its territory, so I would imagine that anything was possible. Everything from ghosts to bad karma from the atrocities of slavery to missing 411 cases, you name it, it's happened here. I've researched the area where that campsite is located. It's part of a state park and I've searched online reviews to see if anyone else has had any paranormal experiences there. All the reviews I see are good ones with only minor complaints such as the neighboring campsite had a dog that barked all night, or that the kitty playground wasn't very fun. Nothing referring to cold spots, missing people, ghosts, or anything of the sort. If someone has had a really scary experience at this particular place, I've yet to find it, and I've studied it in depth. Anyway, I don't remember arriving, unpacking, or even what we did most of the time, but I do know we stopped at a flea market on the way. I remember walking through the aisles, admiring a doll that was way too expensive for me to buy, and I remember filming some scenery and some of us clowning around, although the film did not turn out well and was sort of faded. I still have it to this day and can remember some of what I filmed. Vicky is nowhere to be seen in the film. That's why I think she didn't arrive until that night or the second night we were there. At some point, we girls gathered in some sort of arts and crafts building to make some small floral arrangements. I don't know why we did this, unless there's something in the Bible about lavender, because that's what they were made of. They were like little dried flower posies made of lavender. To this day, I cannot stand the smell of lavender, real or fake. It's like garlic to a vampire with me. I'll explain why later. The next thing I remember is being gathered around a bonfire, but we weren't close to our cabins. We were instead out in a field, with the fire glowing, and there was some sort of half-barn amphitheater thing off to the side. It looked like something put up for local bands, or it could have been used for a church group gathering. At the time, it was pitch black dark out, except for the firelight and some small outdoor lights on the stage area. And of course, who should be sitting up on the stage, ready to grace us with a song? You guessed right. There sat Vicky, with an 80s boombox and an accompaniment tape, ready to belt out another high soprano number. 
Another strange thing is that I don't remember her hiking with us up to this place, so she must have drove down there in her car. We could do little but sit still and awkwardly listen to the song, out in the middle of nowhere. Now here is a very strange thing that I didn't remember until years later. Think about this. We were sitting either on the ground or on benches in August, right? I don't remember getting a single bug bite of any kind. We were out there at least an hour or two, because after Vicky's solo was over, I'm sure the youth pastor gave some sort of message or devotional reading or something. I remember we roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. I do seem to remember that, but not one mosquito bite. The next thing I remember is lying in one of the bunks in the cabin. I don't remember putting on one of the long night shirts I always slept in, so I may have just slept in my clothes. And I don't remember taking a shower, although there was a bathroom in the cabin, so we didn't have to go to a bathhouse or anything. I was kind of a clean freak, especially when I was in any kind of camping situation, so I'm sure I probably did take a shower, but I honestly don't remember doing it. Anyway, the cabin was divided into two rooms, with the bathroom between them. On the previous retreat, I'd stayed in the back room, where there were stacked bunk beds. This time, however, I got stuck in the front room with a single bunk against the wall. I say I got stuck, because guess who decided to spend the night instead of driving back? Yep, Vicky. I wasn't thrilled about this, and I was even getting concerned, but could do nothing about it. The rest of the girls had all the back bunks claimed. Except for two or three girls, the rest of the group was younger than I, and looking back, I don't remember how I got stuck with the younger set. Not that I didn't like them, but I felt frankly too old to be on this trip. I was outgrowing the youth group. To give you an idea of my bunk's position, if I got off the bunk to my right, the front door of the cabin was about 11 or 12 feet in front of me. There was a small high window to the right of the front door, high enough so that no one passing by could look inside. It was glass and had no screen. Keep this in mind for later as well. The rest of the bunks were also to my right. There were about five or six other girls and two counselors, one of which was Vicky. The third counselor was in the back room with the rest. I could do nothing except get through this night and dream of being 18 the next year, when my parents would no longer be able to force me to do anything or go anywhere I didn't want to. But for now, what could I do? Where could I go? I knew I wanted to leave, but I was over 100 miles from home. And there were no cell phones then, so I couldn't just call my parents to come pick me up. And I couldn't get one of the other counselors with the guys to drive me all the way home in the middle of the night. So I was absolutely stuck. The bunks weren't all crowded together like what you see in a makeshift disaster shelter. But the room was not very large either. So we were all still close together. I'd say I was probably 10 feet from Vicky's bunk. She was to my right, toward the front door in the middle of the room. She wasn't blocking the door in any way, but if I had decided to leave, I would have had to walk past her. My bunk had a very worn out mattress and I remember saying that I felt like a hot dog because the sides folded up around me like a bun. That sounds funny, I know, but later that night, I was glad that it did. It helped to hide me. In addition to not getting any bug bites, I will mention two more strange things before I try to describe what happened next. As I said, this was in the middle of August in the Mid-South in a cabin with no air conditioning. At no time do I remember feeling hot, and I'm sure it was hot and humid, because we had been hot and sweating while I'd been filming earlier in the day. So I was lying there in a bunk with some kind of clothing on with a mattress folded up around me in August, and I was not hot. This wasn't normal. The second abnormal thing was that not only did I not have any bug bites, I didn't hear any bugs either. This is worth noting because at that time of year, the noise from cicadas, or cicadas, and katydids is deafening. Even as I finally drifted off to sleep in that cheap mattress, I don't remember any sounds from outside. No deer walking around, no sound from the boy's cabin, no bugs, no distant traffic or planes flying overhead, no coyotes, no owls, no crickets, nothing. I know that total silence in the woods setting is abnormal and usually means something's wrong. If I were in the same situation today, I would have gotten up, walked to the campsite office, and called myself a cab. But as I said, I was young, innocent, naive, and thought, oh so wrongly, that I was safe. 
I was deeply asleep when I heard the crashing of shattering glass. Then there was a long, piercing scream. My eyes snapped open, and immediately I looked at the high glass window, thinking in nanoseconds, I can't believe one of the boys would throw a rock through our window. They were all good kids. Vandalism just wasn't something they would have done, not even to prank us. My brain was trying to wake up completely, and after about two more seconds, I was wide awake. But I didn't move. Something was telling me, don't move. What I heard then was this. Did you hear that demon fly out of my mouth? I raised my face just barely over the edge of my folded up mattress, and I saw Vicky shrieking this and rocking back and forth. The other counselor sprang up and started to try to console and shush her. She had a flashlight and her Bible opened, starting to read scriptures to her. I couldn't tell if Vicky was crying or just mumbling incoherently. Again, I looked up at the window. It wasn't broken, so where had the crashing of glass sound come from? I lay completely still, although every cell in my body was screaming at me to run out the front door and just keep running. It had finally happened. This woman had gone off the deep end. It was around 3.30 a.m., I think, and here is another phenomenal thing. None of the girls woke up and asked what was going on. They continued to sleep as though they'd been drugged. No one stirred. No one moved. I thought that maybe, like me, they were just too afraid to move. But some of them were snoring. I could hear it, from the front room and from the back of the cabin. I was in survival mode at this point. I lay as still as the dead. Let me also make this clear, that I did not have sleep paralysis. I was wide awake. I could move. But as I said, something inside my head was telling me to freeze. Chalk it up to an angel or my second sight or whatever label you want to put on it. But I was wide awake and staring. At one point, the other counselor looked around in the dark with a flashlight, perhaps to see if any of us had awakened. And when I saw the beam moving over towards me, I snapped my eyes shut. I would play dead if I had to. I listened to the counselor praying and I remember wanting to jump out of that bunk and run so badly. I was young and lean then, and they most likely couldn't have caught up to me. But I didn't breathe, I didn't pray, and I didn't move. I was being told not to move, and I did as I was told. After about ten minutes, the other counselor got up and ran to the bathroom. I don't know if she was throwing up or if it literally scared the crap out of her, but she stayed in there for a while, with the door pretty much open which left me alone with a crazy woman and a room full of slumbering adolescents. With great difficulty, I raised my head only slightly, enough to keep my eye on Vicky. If she got off that bunk, that was it. I would run to the back room and slam the door and barricade myself in with the girls in the back. She was still rocking, with her back to me, facing the front of the cabin. She was still muttering to herself, or at least I think so. I couldn't understand anything she was saying. Maybe it was another language, or knowing her, she probably thought she was speaking in tongues. Then, this woman turned her head around to look over her shoulder, looking in my direction. It really was as if whatever had taken over her knew that I was awake, because she didn't turn to look at anyone else. My head was only barely elevated, but I saw her face lit from below by the flashlight, which makes even normal people look creepy. So we have to factor that in here, but what little I did see I never wanted to see again. What I saw was nothing like the silly CGI stuff or demonic makeup in Halloween stores. The problem is, I can't really describe what I saw, but I'll try. Her eyes were dark, but not like those black-eyed kids or something like that, just dark, as if the eyes themselves had sunk into the sockets. The face looked both angry, scared, sad, all of that all at once. She looked right at me, straight into my eyes for only a second, because I snapped my eyes shut again to block her, or it, out. Also, her hair covered part of her face, so I didn't get a clear look, thank goodness. If this woman was doing all of this as a prank, which I seriously considered over the years, then she could have earned an Oscar for her performance but a prank could not explain the window shattering while somehow remaining unbroken, and it could not explain her sudden bass baritone voice. 
What she said to me when she looked at me, I don't know, I don't ever want to know, it was some incomprehensible language, or it may have been gibberish. I only saw her mouth move for a second, as she spoke behind some strands of hair. I fully expected this insane woman to get out of bed and come after me, but she simply turned around and continued muttering in that low bass voice. The high soprano voice was gone. After a few more minutes, the other counselor came back and Vicky asked her in her now normal voice, are you okay? Whether the other counselor heard the low bass voice from the bathroom or not, I'll never know. I swear on my life, everything I've just written is true. It's possible for sopranos to lower their voices, sure. In Mongolia, it's known as throat singing. So maybe this woman had some voice training? Maybe that's what she did. It may have been that she was just a mentally ill individual and that this was a desperate plea for attention. Maybe she was trying to give us some twisted spiritual lesson on demons. But that does not explain the window. It still haunts me to this day. I do remember looking around the floor in the morning for broken glass, for pieces of the window. When I couldn't find any, I thought that maybe she had broken a glass of water when she shot up from the bed shrieking. Oh, and that shriek, I can still hear it, as if it just happened. It never goes away, and I guess it never will. And the silence, no girls stirring or coming in from the back room to ask what was going on, no animal noises or cicadas singing in the trees. I should have been wringing wet with sweat, either from the August heat or a cold sweat from pure terror. Anyway, after all this, Vicky and the counselor collapsed onto their bunks from sheer exhaustion. But I lay awake from about 3.45 to 4 a.m. until dawn. All around the room hung those dried lavender flowers, whose fragrance had now become a sickening, overpowering stench that made me nauseous. They had not bothered me in the slightest until now, as I lie there waiting for an eternity to pass before the dimmest hope of light began to show through the unbroken window. Still, not one of the girls moved, not even to get up to go to the bathroom. The only sound was slight snoring, and even that was muffled. I never took my eyes off Vicky even though she was completely asleep, completely still. I did not move. In the years since this happened, I've pulled all-nighters to study in college, and worked overnights in a department store, so I know what it is to be tired from staying awake all night. But none of that can possibly compare to the exhaustion I felt that next morning. I think I pretended to be asleep until most everyone had gone out for breakfast. I don't remember seeing Vicky outside around the picnic tables when we had our Bible study before we left. I don't remember eating either, nor talking to anyone. I found my younger brother and asked which car he was riding back in. Everyone else had claimed their rides, I guess, and no one seemed to want to ride with Edward, the older gentleman in his 70s, who had come out on the trip to cook for us. He had volunteered to help with the guys and brought his old Sanford and Son type truck, with no air conditioning. My brother said he was going to ride with him, so I climbed in next to him. We left the premises, and I never looked back, and I've never gone back to that place. We got out on the two-lane road to get to the highway, and somewhere down the road, maybe five or six miles, the sun came out shining bright. Then and only then did I start to feel hot and start to sweat. Normally, I'm an air conditioning addict, but for once, it felt good to feel this heat, because the heat felt normal. I was back with two normal people in an old rattle trap truck, headed home. Edward was a quiet, soft-spoken man, and we rode with him all the way back home, listening to his calm, soothing voice as he talked about this and that. I was glad we had chosen him to get us home. Surprisingly, my life went back to normal after that. Within the next couple of weeks, I started school and was glad to be around normal people in a normal classroom. Somehow that dried lavender had come home with me and I don't understand how that happened, because I never packed it, but you can bet I threw it out. If my brother had caught wind of any of these events, he never did speak about it. As far as I know, neither did any of the other guys. None of the girls seemed to know about it either. They'd all slept through it. We've talked about that retreat in years since, and they've never acted like they knew anything unusual happened, so I kept my mouth shut. I don't know if what happened at that place had to do with the location itself, 
out in the Appalachian Trail, or if it was brought in by this crazy church woman. The atmosphere seemed normal until she joined our group that evening. Even though I'd felt uneasy about going on the trip at first, I must have been distracted enough by my filmmaking on that first day, because the sense of foreboding was temporarily alleviated. The anxious feeling returned when we arrived at that bonfire, right before she arrived. In time, Vicky seemed to just fade away from that church, going off to act crazy in someone else's unfortunate house of worship. After the incident, I went to church less and less. I got into some heated arguments with my mother over it. It's not like I had a problem with the faith itself. It was just fear of certain people. But I couldn't explain this to her. By the next year, I was legally an adult, and there wasn't much she could do to force me to go. Whenever I would give in and go, I would show up late, barely heard the sermon, and I would duck out as soon as the preacher would start the closing prayer. I just couldn't be around those people anymore. Even though Vicky had gone, there were still some other weird church people to avoid, so I did. I buried what had happened and never talked about it, but I've always had one burning question. Why was I the only one of the youth group to be awakened? Why me? That scares me more than anything else, and I don't know that I want an answer to that question at all. The only time I saw Vicky after she had left the church was about three years later in a small grocery store. I ran into an old friend of mine from high school and we were standing there in the checkout line when the front door slid open and in walked Vicky talking with someone. She didn't see me, fortunately. In an instant, I ducked down behind the magazine and candy stands and my friend thought I was having a fainting spell or something. She wasn't too far off the mark. I suddenly felt queasy and dizzy-headed. I looked up and asked her, where's that woman that just came in? She told me she'd walk to the far back of the store, so I got up quickly and did the fastest checkout of my life. The cashier knew something was wrong and hurriedly scanned everything for me. My friend helped me bag my items, and when we got outside, I told her that I had a horrible experience with that woman on a church retreat, and I had to get out of here before she came back. She understood, and we exchanged phone numbers to stay in touch. After that, I jumped into my car and sped off, from then on, I absolutely avoided that part of town, and I still do today, just in case. It's possible that Vicky may be dead now. She was in her late 40s or 50s back then, but who knows. My only advice to anyone in church is this. Just because a person goes to church doesn't automatically make them sane or trustworthy. If you're a parent, check out the people going along as counselors on your child's church camp trips. If they claim to be Christian or whatever faith you follow, that doesn't really mean anything. Maybe it mattered in the old days and carried more weight then, but not anymore. And if your child is feeling uneasy about something, anything, don't just brush it off. Children, even in adolescence, are sometimes more in tune with the ability to sense when someone or something is just wrong. And while I personally do not play around with Ouija boards, witchcraft, or calling up spirits, the evil that these crazy, supposedly more spiritually gifted women see is, in reality, not to be found in your latest heavy metal rock album or action figure or role-playing game. Sometimes that evil is sitting or standing right next to you in church, and it may want a hug. Coal Mine Road From Dean When I was young, my parents moved around a lot. I must have attended 10 different schools during my life. My dad was the kind of man who shouldn't have had kids. He wouldn't keep a steady job and forced my mother and later my aunt to work long hours to support our family, which included six kids. He was a schemer and always looking for an angle to work. My earliest memories were bar fights and my dad robbing my piggy bank while he was drunk in the middle of the night. My mom followed him like a god. To this day, I don't understand why. He was physically violent with her, and she stayed with him for over 20 years until all the kids had grown. I guess she stayed for us more than anything. The story actually begins when I was 10 years old. My dad outfitted an old school bus with bunks, 
and we traveled across the country from Utah to Indiana and finally to Kentucky, where the bus engine died. So the bus was our home for a long time, until Dad finally rented what could only be described as a shack on the side of a mountain. This was near Burksville, in what is known as the Cumberland Gap. Very mountainous with steep hills, with gravel roads carved into the mountains. The house we rented was from an old man named Howard, who owned a gas station and convenience store where two roads intersected. Howard was a good old man who took a liking to my dad. He used to give us the flat sodas from his gas station when we were waiting on the bus. For us, it was a very rare treat to drink anything more than water. There were six of us kids altogether. Marty, who was just a baby. Michael, who was in kindergarten. My sisters Jean and Carol Ann, who were in third. And my brother Jim, who was in the second grade. I was the oldest in fourth grade. We would walk down a steep gravel road that was about a quarter of a mile from the house each day to the bus stop. I remember the gravel road was overgrown and had old houses that were dilapidated on both sides. The town had been part of the company housing for a coal mine that closed up back in the 50s. Kudzu and vines covered houses. Old trucks and cars that were no more than rust piles lined the sides of the road looking out of the brush as if they were trying to hide. Howard called it the coal mine road. The house we lived in was at the top of the hill from the gas station, then about a quarter mile down coal mine road on the right. It was the only house not grown over with kudzu and weeds. The road kept going to a clearing where Howard had an oil rig. I remember there were copperhead snakes, and we'd keep ourselves at the center of the road so no one would get snake bit. Sometimes they would come out onto the gravel and warm in the sun, especially early in the morning. We would throw gravel at them to keep them back. We were warned never to venture off the path because Howard had told us that there were hidden dangers all around. Old cellars that had caved in, uncovered wells, and of course, the snakes. Mom was very careful to keep us all near or in the house as much as she could. But being the oldest boy, I would be sent out to get coal from a coal pile. A potbelly stove was all we had for heat. It was a chance to goof off and look around, throwing old rocks at the windows of those old houses I could see through the woods. One day, Mama asked me to go out and bring in some coal. I was watching TV on a black and white TV set in the bedroom, and I didn't want to get up. So I acted like I didn't hear Mom ask. She finally came in the room fussing and said that if I didn't get the coal right now, it would be dark. So out I went. We had an old wheelbarrow that we used to bring the coal up to the house. Then we'd take a few large pieces in and put them beside the stove. For those of you who don't know, coal is very dirty, and it gets all over you. The old wheelbarrow had a steel wheel that needed grease and would squeal as you pushed it down the road and over to a pile of coal that Howard had brought out for us to keep warm. In a lot of ways, I think Howard worried about us in that old drafty house. This was sort of his way of helping. It was already dark when I shoveled the last of the coal into the wheelbarrow and turned toward the house. Then, I saw something. On the road past our home, there was a light. It was dim like an old lantern. Dad wasn't home, that I knew. He was working at a blue jean factory four hours away, and he wouldn't be home until Friday. The light bobbed as it came slowly up the road, like someone walking. There was nothing down that road now, no reason for anyone to be coming up from the old oil rig and coal mine, and if it was Howard, he would have taken his truck instead of walking. And yet here it was, a dim yellow light that seemed to keep a steady pace toward me. I gave the wheelbarrow a push. Then I stopped. If they didn't know I was here now, that would have told them. I dropped the handles of the wheelbarrow and made a run for the house, hoping I could beat the lantern carrier. 
As I ran the 100 yards or so to the house, the lantern grew closer, but kept its steady pace, not pausing. I could see it was a lamp, flickering with a very dirty, dusty glass cover. I could make out a single person in the light of the lamp as it swung at the end of the arm, walking ever closer to me and my home. I burst through the door of the house and yelled, Mama, there's someone out there on the road, behind the house. Mom came out of the kitchen and came to a halt just inside the living room. There was no doubt based on my face that I'd seen something. I wasn't overly afraid of the dark, and Mom knew that. I didn't spook easily, and she knew I was usually the one who got rid of the snakes and defended the younger kids from bullies. She said in a calm voice, Lock the door. I ran back to the front door and shut it quickly, not taking time to look for the lantern. I turned the old deadbolt lock and a homemade wooden lock we had made with a nail and a flat piece of wood. Mom came into the living room with a single 16-gauge shotgun. Her dad gave her that gun, and that may be the only reason we still had it, because she refused to let dad sell it. By this time, the other kids were coming into the room. She told them in a hushed voice to go to the bedroom and lock the door. It must have been the tone of her voice, because they did exactly that. I could hear Marty crying behind the door and my oldest sister hushing him. She walked around cutting off lights, the kitchen, the hall where the potbelly stove was, the living room. The house had those old string lights to a single bulb, so as each light went out, the house grew very dark. The only light was the light of the porch light and the light from under the bedroom door. Mama began to peek out the windows. First, she looked out the kitchen window. The back door was locked, I could see. She peeked out the small window and the door then, and then the living room windows, then the bathroom. Nothing. She turns to me and asks, Are you sure you saw someone? I answered quickly. Yes, they had a lantern and were walking up the road. From the mine? She was looking at me intently with a furrowed brow now, her voice raised like she was questioning the information. You better be telling me the truth, she responded flatly, rechecking each window. I was hurt and at the same time angered by her lack of belief. I then started checking the windows myself, but I didn't see anything either. Finally, Mom opens the front door and steps out on the porch. She goes to the edge and looks up and down the road. I peeked out from behind her and didn't see anything either. The moon was above the trees now, and you could see clearly there wasn't anyone on the road. I guess it would be easy enough to turn off the lantern and slip into the woods, but why? We didn't have any kind of flashlight, so we had to just strain our eyes and see what we could. Nothing moved. No noises came from the woods but we could hear the other kids bumping around in the bedroom. We went back inside and shut the door. She put the shotgun in the corner by the door and looked at me with surprising compassion after such a scare. Maybe we have enough coal for the night. She smiled at me. I really saw something, Mama. I once again insisted. Maybe it was Howard. We'll ask him in the morning. She walked back to the kitchen, leaving me standing by the door. The next morning, I woke to a very cold house. No one else was up, but the fire had burned down to cinders, and there wasn't any more coal in the house. I got up, slid on my pants and shoes. I went to the front door and saw the shotgun was still in the corner by the door, where Mama had left it the night before. I peeked out the living room window, Everything that had happened the night before returning fresh to my memory. Unlocking the front door, I opened it and I looked outside. My mouth dropped open. The wheelbarrow filled with the coal I'd loaded the night before was now just sitting on the porch. Someone had taken the wheelbarrow to the house and up the five steps to the porch without anyone hearing it. One more thing. Sitting on top of the coal 
was an old kerosene lantern. I poked my head out into the brisk air. I thought it was cold in the house until that frosty October morning met my bare arms and face. I looked up and down the old road and around the house, no sign of anyone. I brought in a couple of pieces of coal and started up the fire. We never did find out who my mystery helper was. We found out later that day that Howard had been out of town at a doctor's office in Versailles, and Dad didn't come home until later that Saturday afternoon. Howard said it looked like one of the old lanterns in an old storage shed near the entrance of the mine. Dad, Howard, and I walked out the road the next day. I remember I had a hard time keeping up, it was so grown over. Howard toted an old black revolver, and Dad had Mom's shotgun. First, we went to the old shed. The door was bolted, and the padlock was rusted beyond opening. We then traipsed through the tall weeds and kudzu until dark checking each of the old houses, but they were all still boarded up. There were no signs of entry, except for some broken out windows that were probably from my rocks. From that day forward, I went out early to get the coal, with the exception of a few really cold nights. Those nights I did venture out after dark, I took my lantern. Terror in the Wild and Wonderful Mountains of West Virginia From Wayside Strangler 86 If anyone's ever seen the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia before, it's the exact area where this event occurred. I literally had to drive by their house on the way. Hank Williams III also wrote a song about it called Boone County Blues which really captures the essence of the depressing, drug-consumed area. I worked as a lab technician for an independent company. I would run analyses on coal samples to determine the quality. BTUs, ash, sulfur, things of that nature. Part of the job was driving company pickup trucks to various different coal mines, train loadouts, and the river docks to draft barges and collect samples. We got a call at around 2 a.m. to go pick up a train sample over in an incredibly remote area. The mine was miles away from absolutely anything. In order to get there, I had to drive across a place called Williams Mountain, home of Jesco and all the other whites. It's a notoriously steep, curvy, and dangerous mountain with a very high rate of accidents. I made it to the mine and collected the sample without incident. After about 15 minutes of driving, I started back up the steep mountain. Having made the trip numerous times, I could take the curves pretty fast, especially when it's pitch dark and you can see headlights approaching you. The nearest stoplights, stop signs, or streetlights are a good 30 miles away, so it's a different kind of dark. The complete darkness just perfectly compounds the isolation. It was because I was driving so fast that I was completely caught by surprise when it appeared that there was a vehicle quickly catching up to me. I started to speed up, but before I knew it, they had caught up with me. When they got close, they turned on their high beams. I could tell it was a truck from the height of the lights, but the bright lights had me somewhat blinded. It was then when the terror really began. They started edging closer and closer until they were right up my rear. It didn't matter how fast I went, they stayed right on me. All of a sudden, they just stopped in the road and killed their headlights. Completely weirded out and rattled, I took a huge sigh of relief and began laughing nervously as they dropped from sight. Thinking it was just someone's idea of a cruel joke. Never had I been so ready to see that city skyline. Not too long after, and to my complete and utter horror, the lights began quickly climbing the mountain once again. Frantic, I punched the gas, almost wrecking twice trying to flee, but it was no use. Again, the bright lights filled up my mirrors and simultaneously filled my heart with fear and absolute dread. They would back off some, 
then get extremely close, repeating this over and over and over until they finally rammed me twice. The second time was hard enough to make me swerve, though thankfully I was able to ride it out. I should note, there is absolutely nowhere to pull off while traversing the mountain. Just guardrails on either side, and drop-offs wherever the rails are missing. There's only one little church on a wide spot on the side of the road, so I tried to pull over and let them pass. I put on my signal and turned off, but my pursuers turned off as well and killed their lights. I hid my vehicle and ducked down trying to watch out for any movement. Nothing. Two or three minutes probably goes by and I made my move, frantically peeling out. To my unimaginable relief, they did not pull out too, but I wasn't convinced it was over. Sure enough, the lights approached once more, though this time it was accompanied by a sound, an unmistakable gut-wrenching sound of gunshots. I'd heard the term hyperventilate, but at that moment I discovered the full force of its meaning. Barely able to breathe, I ducked down as low as I could and began reciting a nonsensical plea for help. This was before cell phones were popular, but to this day, service there is non-existent. The bullets rang out like a soundtrack for my misery, and all I could think at that moment was that I never would see my loved ones again. Time is truly subjective. It felt as though I was on that mountain for days, but I finally reached the end. I eventually saw a few houses and immediately pulled into the first place I could. The truck didn't turn down the driveway, but lingered in the road with the headlights off. After a couple of minutes, a porch light came on and the truck did a donut, starting back up the mountain. A man emerged from the home but I left as soon as the truck's lights were out of sight. I yelled, sorry, out the window, and drove like a reckless lunatic the rest of the way. I ended up getting pulled over for speeding on the interstate. I didn't even attempt to explain, as I figured it was a small price to pay, all things considered. Obviously, I never entertained the idea of ever making that run again, and my boss began collecting samples in the daytime only for that particular site. The mountains of West Virginia are incredibly beautiful, but there's also a lot of danger lurking in the depths of their remote isolation. Places that inspire movies like Wrong Turn. Places where no one can hear you scream. Giggles from Sidriax. I used to work for a motorcycle company in a very rural province of the Philippines. Unlike other places, my home island has only one city for now, and that's where our main office is located. My job at the time was as a field representative, but I mostly handled the collection of monthly payments from our customers. Most of our customers live in various secluded areas near the shorelines, mountains, and vast forests, hence why I was required to go collect their payments. More often than not, they supposedly forgot their monthly due dates, so it's up to me to remind them. I'm only a 5 foot 6 tall guy, but I'm not skinny, like my other co-workers, and before joining the company, I was an avid mountain biker and hiker, because I was raised in a very far off farm with no electricity or motorized transportation. Anyway, because of my nature, the office always puts me in charge of going to the most mountainous areas covered by woods. I didn't really complain at first. All these places that I had to go to were very secluded to the point that even electricity is non-existent, and people there live as if it's the Middle Ages. One of these days, I started off early, since I had to ride a motorcycle provided by the office as a means of transport. This motorcycle was clunky, old, and it had more repairs than a World War II war machine. But I trusted it enough that I called it Ox, because no matter how hard or impassable the terrain was, it had never let me down before. But I do have to repair Ox while on the way every now and then, but nothing major. As I reached the foot of the mountain, I prepared a bit by checking my gas, inspecting Ox, and waterproofing my everyday carry stuffs. I never leave home without a knife, 
and on cases like these I always brought one of my large blades. I revved up Ox and we started to tackle this steep dirt road used by large trucks heading up the mountain. My client for the day was a tribesman who worked in a mine and it always takes me two hours to get to the top of the mountain where his village is situated. The path there was very hard and I was the only one who was able to get to the area. There were no houses along the way, just vast, deep woods all around. Usually, in places like these, I would hear the typical rainforest sounds every time, but that day was different. I stopped for a while and had my breakfast on the side of the road. Ox was parked on a grassy part, while my food and hot coffee were placed on top of the gas tank and seat. While I took a sip of my hot drink, I heard what seemed to be giggling sounds behind me. It was almost as if children were playing nearby. I looked around but saw nothing, so I ignored it, thinking it was a bird. When I bit into my food, I heard it again. Something felt off because the surroundings fell silent, and all I heard was the giggling getting closer from behind. I packed my stuff and unlocked the pin holding my knife. I know I sound like a coward, but I'd experienced the paranormal since childhood, and sometimes it can get physically dangerous. I relaxed a bit trying to focus to where the sound was coming from. I thought about this giggling sound and figured it could be two things. One, just a playful spirit teasing me. Two, it could be a bad one that follows you home so it can torment you for life. My grandparents told me that I needed to be respectful towards such beings, but I should never show weakness nor fear. I pulled out my 14-inch blade and took a stance as if I was ready to strike whatever would jump out of the woods. The ordeal lasted for about five minutes. It was quiet. I could hear my heartbeat and breathing. Then I spoke in a very serious tone, stating, Sorry if I disturbed you. I'm just resting and I'll be on my way now. It was still silent, and after a few seconds, the normal forest sounds returned. The area felt somewhat the same again. I said thank you, and I went on my way. I made it to the small village, consisting of no more than 25 houses. I made it to my client, and he offered me coffee. I got his payment, which was three months due. While resting a bit, I recalled what happened. My client suddenly asked me if I encountered any other problems along the way. I said there was nothing else, but I asked why. He told me that one of the villagers died not too long ago. It was very sudden. One day that villager changed and acted odd, becoming paranoid for seemingly no reason, shouting in the middle of the night and running away to God knows where. He went missing for days, and was found dead under a tree. The elder shaman said the poor man was haunted by an evil spirit, and it took his soul. The man was never a brave one to begin with, and was easily scared by anything. I thought about what my client said and bid him farewell. I rode down the mountain and passed the spot where I rested and had no other issues. I went home exhausted, and dropped onto my bed. I remembered the events that happened and thought about what I encountered back there. Was it the same evil spirit? Did I have a standoff against it and prevail? I had no idea, but I knew for sure that with my line of work, it would not be the last time that I'd encounter such incidents. The Sasquatch Stalker from Crystal Holly 22. Location, North Carolina. This story happened when I was 12 or 13. I was getting off at my usual bus stop at about 4.30 p.m. in the evening. From there, I had an eight minute walk down a sort of long, cracked road. Where I lived was a new housing development and because of this, on my left side of the road was pure swamp and dense woods, while on my right, there were a few houses here and there. As I was walking home, I felt this unease, as if I was being watched. 
Now, to be honest, I did get this feeling a lot when I was in or near the woods, so I blew off the feeling, chalking it up to me just being scared. At most, it was just some territorial forest animal watching me. As I continued, the feeling of being watched never left. I was about 70 yards from my home when I heard it. The sound of something walking in the woods. Leaves and branches breaking underneath heavy feet. It sounded as if the creature was following me while using the forest as cover to not be seen. So I stopped in my tracks to see if I could see anything in the forest, to see what or who was walking around. But I saw nothing, nothing at all. I thought maybe it was all in my head, but as soon as I began walking again, that thing in the woods started to walk as well. So I stopped walking once more, and it stopped. Then I started walking again, and it started. This creature was following me and walking the same pace as me, stopping when I stopped and walking when I walked. I found this quite odd, but this seemed to be as if the creature was stalking me. It was watching me, but why? Was it making sure I didn't approach it or come anywhere close to it? Suddenly, I saw a small rock flying at me. Not sure what to do, I picked a small rock up and threw it back into the woods. I wanted to see how the creature would react. Would it run away or would it follow me still? But nothing happened. No sounds of running or walking occurred. Assuming the creature was still there, I hurried the rest of my way home into the backyard where my father was to tell him about my experience. After telling him and my younger brother about the experience, I also went to tell my younger neighbor about it. Together, we decided we'd go into the woods to see if we could find what we all now thought was a Bigfoot. My dad and I loved watching mountain monsters, so we decided we'd do what they did when hunting for a supposed Bigfoot. We grabbed a big stick and hit a tree with three large hits. Nothing at first, so my dad hit the tree three more times. That's when he yelled at us that he saw something behind a big fallen tree trunk. At first, we thought he was seeing things, until I saw a dark figure behind that trunk. It had thick, dark, brownish fur. The creature was huge, very huge, even though it was crouched. Wanting to catch its attention, I picked a thicker branch and slammed it into a tree three times. For a minute, it was quiet. Then my dad yelled to run. We listened and came bustling out of the forest to the neighbor's house. Safe and out of the woods, I asked my dad, why'd you tell us to run? He calmly tells me that when I wasn't paying attention, the creature behind the fallen trunk began to rise and stand up. My dad, not wanting to be there any longer, had us run. I don't know what would have happened if we stayed there longer. I love going in the woods, and I still do. But this encounter is one of the many encounters from the woods that is still burned into my memory. A reminder that the forest hides more than just coyotes and bears. It can hide much bigger and scarier creatures that you really don't want to ever encounter. Something in the Colorado Cabin From Just Some Random Texan Back in August, my friend group and I went on a road trip to an Airbnb cabin hidden in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. It was a very small town, which took less than five seconds to pass on the highway. Because of this, we actually missed our turn at first, because it was the only intersection in the entire town, and it wasn't marked at all. Our cabin was 30 minutes down winding dirt roads, hidden in some woods. It was an older but still very beautiful three-story log cabin. Originally, there were going to be more than ten of us, but some of us got the Rona and others had to stay home for work. So, in the end, only about seven people were in the cabin. Weird things quickly began as we were settling in. We heard footsteps coming from areas where none of us were. 
Doors opened and closed on their own. We tried not to think too much of it, rationalizing it as wind or drafts. After all, we had doors open, carrying stuff in from our cars. If it wasn't that, then maybe it was some animals on the roof or something. Later that night, we were all smoking and drinking, just like a bunch of 19 to 22 year olds would on an unsupervised trip to Colorado. That's when things got even more interesting. Doors slamming, what sounded like whispers coming from empty rooms, and even more footsteps. By then, we were starting to get freaked out a little bit, but again, we tried to explain it away. Maybe we were hearing other people at cabins down the road. We knew they were there because we'd seen them walking out earlier, and we'd passed by their cabins on the way to ours. The second day, we'd gone exploring. I brought a camera with me and caught a couple of odd shadows, but those may have been just tricks of the light filtering down through the trees. But the woods itself gave off a very strange and unsettling vibe, like something was off. A few spots in the cabin had the same energy. That night was about the same. Smoking and drinking, footsteps, voices, and doors. The third day is when things started getting a little more strange. A few incidents happened. One of us, Ricky, went out exploring again with Ethan, another one of our group. We'd made a very strict rule that no one was to venture out alone, not even by car. They ended up getting separated, and Ethan came back first, saying he didn't know where Ricky was. Then Ricky showed up, saying he had fought a snake and almost lost. We got on them about getting separated, but we ended up joking with Ricky, saying that he almost lost to a tiny snake. He did admit it was only a small garter snake. Later on, a more serious incident happened. Sarah, one of the girls in our group, was slicing limes for drink mixers and cut a slice off the tip of her thumb. But from the way everyone screamed, you'd think she had cut off her whole thumb. That's what I actually thought, so I kept suggesting we call an ambulance until I learned how small it was. She got over it quick. Later on, she ended up chasing Brooke, the other girl who's very squeamish about injuries, trying to shove her cut thumb in her face. What happened a couple of hours later, though, was really what made the night scary. Ricky was on the ground floor by himself, picking up a few things after we'd had a big game of pool in the game room. Suddenly, we heard him scream. What the heck was that? We all ran downstairs to see what had scared him. We found Ricky staring at the door to the laundry room, which was one of those rooms that had a strange vibe and we'd heard other sounds coming from it. He explained that he'd heard a girl's voice coming from inside that room. Then we all heard another sound, like a voice. We all went quiet, listening closely. I got out my phone and I began to record. A few seconds later, we clearly heard a girl's voice say, Hello. Although it came out rather quiet in the video. The video will be linked in the description if you want to hear it. Now, of course, we all go absolutely nuts because we know for a fact that no one was in that room. We were just in there not 15 minutes earlier. We all began to storm up the stairs, and Jack, Sarah's boyfriend, actually pushes Sarah and Matthew, another guy in the trip, behind him so he can get up the stairs faster. Now we're all understandably terrified at this point. Matthew just kind of sits down on the floor in shock. Brooke tries to rationalize it, saying if it's another one of Sarah's tricks, she's walking right out the door. Sarah's known for pulling pranks on us. Harmless ones, though. We then hear Ricky in the background saying, I'm about to throw some hands, although I'm not sure who he thinks he's going to fight. A ghost? Good luck with that. Brooke goes back downstairs, and the video ends there. But she hears the voice again and comes screaming back up the stairs. We pour some drinks and smoke some, trying to forget what happened by talking to some coyotes we hear out in the woods while sitting on the balcony. The following day, another incident happens. 
Ricky makes the dumb decision to leave and explore the woods by himself, while the rest of us are still sleeping. My room was on the ground floor, by the way, less than 20 feet from the laundry room. The rest of us wake up, and understandably get very worried. Before long, we get ready to go search for him, but then he walks back in the cabin. His jacket is torn, and he's got some small cuts and bruises. We absolutely go off on him for breaking our golden rule. Turns out he'd gone out to record a TikTok and slipped on a cliff. He would have died if he hadn't miraculously grabbed onto a tree root and a rock. The drop would have been about 150 feet onto solid rocks. We were sitting there thinking our trip had been cursed because weird stuff keeps happening. The rest of the day goes by pretty smoothly. Normal footstep sounds and doors doing their thing. But that night, more than once, we caught Ricky on the ground floor seemingly flirting with someone, but he actively denies it, even now. But he was saying things like, I really like you, and I'm sure you're beautiful, to something that wasn't there. He didn't have his phone on him at the time either, and he wasn't wearing AirPods. We think he was trying to flirt with the ghost, or something paranormal was just messing with his mind. The fifth day, which was our last full day there, was a big adventure. Five of us went to a park to check out an alpine slide. Really fun, it's called Winter Park, by the way, and I highly recommend it. Matthew and Ethan stay back for two reasons. One, they couldn't afford admission. And two, they were starting to get the cabin ready for us to leave. The five of us that were going piled into my little coop. The only other car was Ethan's, and we set off through the mountains. This time we paid attention to the amount of sheer drops out there, always on one side of the road. At one point, we were at a spot with a particularly long drop off our left side, when suddenly around a near blind corner, there are a few mountain goats standing in the road. I slammed on my brakes and began to lose control of the car. My car was older and didn't have anti-lock brakes. We were sliding right towards that huge drop, but thankfully, I got the vehicle to stop. Our discussion then went back to how the trip felt. Our discussion then went back to how the trip felt cursed, because none of the cars we passed that were driving the opposite direction had tried to warn us about the goats. Anyway, we finally got to the place and had some fun. Then we went back to the cabin without any further incidents. That night, our last night, we had a big smoke session and some jello shots and I was outside with my camera on a tripod, taking some night sky shots, which turned out pretty well in my opinion. That was when I glanced at the cabin, and I swear to God, I saw the pale face of a girl, a face that did not belong to any of my friends. It was looking at me from my bedroom window. I rubbed my eyes, and when I looked back, she was gone. I went inside to investigate, completely forgetting my camera, I didn't see anything, so I then went back to the group to finish our little party. Other than seeing the girl, no more major paranormal things happened that night. The next morning, we got packed to leave, and I, being the only Christian of the group, said a small prayer and told any entities in the cabin that they weren't allowed to come home with us. Nothing had felt demonic or evil up to that point, but there was that feeling that something was wrong. A couple of us swear to have actually heard a voice say goodbye as we were walking out the door for the last time. Overall, this was the most terrifying, but also the most fun experience of my life. But even after only a few weeks, the experience felt like a fever dream. We do plan on going back one winter to be able to go skiing and to see the mountains covered in snow. If we stay at the same cabin, I'll be bringing some ghost hunting gear with us, namely an EVP recorder, thermal camera, a cheap digital camera that's not my expensive rig, EMF detector, and maybe a spirit box. I'll post another story, if anything happens on the trip. Never go to Yellowstone. From not going to work, sorry. I'm a 22-year-old guy, and I don't really know where to post this, but I thought it would be as good a place as any. 
It all started on a road trip through the national parks out west. My friends, some guys the same age, and I wanted a fun way to celebrate graduating from college, especially after such a crazy year. Getting sent home during our final semester due to the Rona and graduating online. We hoped that some fresh air would rejuvenate us before we started real adult life in our jobs. We'd all decided to meet at our favorite bar near our college for one final drink to reminisce about the great times we had. We drove around the eerily empty campus. There wasn't a soul in sight. This probably should have just been a sign for us to cancel, as the Rona certainly wasn't showing any signs of stopping, but we ignored it. We were simply too excited. About 160 miles into our trip, we ran into our first of many problems. The car began to overheat. Don't get me wrong, it was a newer BMW, so we didn't think that anything like this was going to happen. But German cars will be German cars. We took it to an auto shop and got it fixed in a couple of hours, as it was an easy coolant leak, and it just needed a new hose. This was another sign that we all just chose to overlook. Oh, how I wish we would have just cut our losses and gone home at this point. Nevertheless, we trekked on, driving another few hundred miles without any issues. We were all so excited, singing our favorite songs, playing random apps to pass the time, and judging random girls on Tinder that we matched with along the way. However, it was around St. Louis that we would run into our second problem, a flat tire. Once again, we ignored this sign and pulled into a random tire shop, got it fixed, and we were on our way once again. After two days of driving, we finally reached Denver. We saw this as a great point to stop for a day and enjoy the city. While it was still pretty much shut down, we still made the most of our time there. The next day, we continued on, hoping to reach Yellowstone by night, but we would run into another big issue. We popped yet another tire. Again, we were near a city, Casper, Wyoming, so we were able to get it fixed quickly and continue our trip the next day. This should have been the final straw. We should have turned back. We'd already blown through most of our budget just from fixing the car. However, we thought, we've already made it this far, what else can go wrong? Oh, how wrong we were. When we pulled into the campsite the next day, we eagerly set up our tents and went on a quick hike. Somehow, we were the only ones at our campsite, as it seemed people were still staying home from the Rona. At the time, we saw this as a massive plus, because to us it meant we could get as drunk and rowdy as we wanted to that night. And as the sun set, that's just what we did. However, something felt off the whole time. You know that feeling you get when you walk in the woods late at night, and you just feel like you aren't alone? Like someone or something is watching you? Like you don't belong there, and you're intruding on something else's territory? That's exactly how I felt the entire time. So, while my friends were getting blasted, I built as big a fire as I could, hoping to give myself a sense of safety and ease my anxiousness. Once I finished, however, a feeling of dread washed over me. I'd never felt so scared in my entire life. It came out of nowhere without any explanation. I decided to call it a night after this, hoping that I could just sleep it off while my friends carelessly drank and played loud music that echoed throughout the valley. I was able to sleep until around 3.40, when I was awakened by something scratching the ground outside our tent. I quickly woke my friend up, asking, what the heck was that? He groggily told me that it was probably a bear, because they had left some garbage on the ground. I went back to sleep, foolishly trusting my friend's explanation. I would wake up a couple more times before the sun rose, hearing more noises throughout the early morning. When we all woke up, 
We got out of the tent to find enormous scratch marks all over the ground, surrounding our tent. It almost looked like it formed a big circle around our tent. And these were no ordinary marks. They were made up of three distinct lines going nearly two inches into the dry dirt. My friends decided to once again blame a bear, despite the trash being left alone and no visible bear tracks. While this spooked me, I knew that we were all larger guys, and we were armed with large knives. We had bought them as a joke for the trip, in case we ran into Bigfoot, but that's another story. We continued our day like the one before, going on long hikes throughout the park, enjoying our last full day there, before moving on to the next park. I don't know why we did this. I wish we hadn't done this. But before going to bed that night, we jokingly made Bigfoot calls to lure back whatever creature had bothered us the night before. We then scurried back into the tent and got into our sleeping bags, the way little kids do when they know they aren't supposed to be up during a sleepover, and hear a parent coming down the stairs. Anyway, the forest seemed particularly loud as we were trying to fall asleep. So many different bugs, so many little animals rustling through the brush nearby. It all seemed normal at the moment. However, I woke up around 1.45 to something very different. The entire forest had gone silent. Now I'd heard when the woods go silent, a predator is nearby. I chalked this up to being the bear from the night before paying us yet another visit. Hoping to catch a glimpse of this bear, I slowly unzipped the door with my flashlight aimed out towards the woods. That's when I saw it. This image still haunts me to this day. Standing only ten feet away from our tent was a massive, pale creature. On all fours, it had to have been around four and a half to five feet tall. It had grossly long arms with three sharp claws. To put it into perspective, one of its hands was next to a Bud Light bottle, and the claw was the same size. Thankfully, it was facing away at the time, so I quickly turned off my flashlight and re-zipped the tent. Silently, I awoke my friends, whispering to them what was going on as they slowly woke up. Obviously, none of them believed me, so they reached for their lights and reopened the door to the tent. Standing there, only five feet from the tent now, was that creature. This is when we saw its eyes huge black eyes that felt as if they were looking through me right into my soul. It stood there quietly, almost as if it was sizing us up, determining if we were worth the effort. Horrified, one of my friends made a quick movement to grab his knife. In response, the creature made a blood-curdling cry, revealing razor-sharp teeth. It leapt at the tent, landing on top, almost crushing us below. It began to wildly scratch at the tent, tearing it apart with mad fury. We scrambled to get out any way we could, hoping to escape our near certain deaths. One of my friends and I were able to squeeze out through cuts in the tent, while the other two were still stuck inside, under the crushing weight of that thing. Now free, my friend and I knew that we'd have to get the creature away from the tent if we wanted our friends to survive. I quickly ran to the nearly dead fire, grabbing one of the few sticks still lit, in the hope of scaring it off. I sprinted at the creature with it, looking like a wild man with a torch. However, this only seemed to startle the creature. It took a few steps off of the tent, then stopped, as if first gathering itself before attacking again. My other two friends, still stuck in the tent, took this as an opportunity to get out, as there likely wouldn't be another. We all ran for the car as fast as we could, not looking back, slamming the door shut behind us. Right as the last car door shut, we felt the creature slam into the trunk of the SUV, shaking the entire car. It rammed the car a few more times before beginning to circle it, staring us down. Luckily, my friend had left his keys in the car. After all, we had been the only ones at the campsite. We were able to get it started. This also gave us a better view of the creature. 
Its off-white skin reflected the LED lights back at us. It was then that the scariest part of the whole experience happened. The creature slowly approached my door, taking cautious step after cautious step. I quickly locked my door and cowered in fear with my other friend in the back seat. As it got closer, it began to look directly at the handle. Then, steadily, it reached out its arm and stuck its claw in between the handle and the door, almost as if it had opened a car door before. It tried to pull the handle multiple times, getting angrier with each failed attempt. Luckily, at that moment, my friend who had been paralyzed with fear had snapped out of it and put the car in drive, flooring it. I've never seen anyone drive that fast in my life. We zipped through the roads as fast as we could, not even checking the rearview mirror to see if it was chasing us. We only stopped once we made it to Cody, Wyoming, needing to fill up our tank as we were running very low after such intense driving. Finally getting out, we looked at the damage, specifically the rear. The entire back hatch had been dented in several inches. I think this was when we realized how close we'd come to the creature killing us inside that car. One more good hit, and the trunk door would have fallen off, giving easy access to four tasty humans trapped in an aluminum can. We eventually made it back to our campus, where we split up, and we went our separate ways. I think the friend whose family owned that vehicle told his parents that a truck had pulled a hit and run, or something along those lines, to explain all the damage but we all knew we couldn't tell anyone about the experience, or we'd be called liars or crazy. This was something that continues to haunt me to this day, and it's why I will never visit a national park again as long as I live. Take this story as a warning to avoid them unless you want to come face to face with a monster. October and December Happenings from Jade. October is said to be the month where the veil is the thinnest between us and the other side. Being a pagan, I believe in many gods, stories, and believe this statement to be very true. I live in Virginia near the mountains, and the property I live on is small but nice. There are plenty of strange stories I could tell you, but I'll settle for a few that happened in October of 2021 and October and December of 2020. The first story was told to me by one of my friends. For context, we've always felt like there was something around my house and the farmlands around it. Between my sister having been outside and hearing knocking sounds that grew near her, and my brother hearing things outside at night, we think it's something not friendly. They say calling it by its name brings it closer. Maybe this is payback for the time I said it so freely as an atheist. Too many strange things happen for me to stay one, though. For now, though, I call them not dear and tailless things. On Halloween night of 2020, I was having fun, working at a local haunt that has since been closed down. The place was easy to keep going because we required no contact with people, as they would be pretend zombies that were shot at by nerf bullets and all that. My friends and I decided to do the haunt together, though Mal had an asthma attack and we had to leave early. Upon trying to leave, we noticed the full moon in the sky, and around it was a ring, like a snake biting its tail sort of ring. Now, as pagans, we could only think of it as an omen. After all, it was Halloween, with a full moon, with a symbol in the sky. Many theories range from Norse, alchemic, or Native American, but all pointed to one thing, a bad omen. We pushed it to the back of our minds, and they drove me home for the night. I told them to be careful while leaving. It was a foggy night, and around the mountains, deer like to jump out in front of people. With that, we exchanged goodbyes and hugs, before I went inside to warm up and clean up. I didn't know it at the time, but our bad omen was true in a way. Mal told me a few weeks later, admitting he didn't want to scare me that night, 
But on the drive out of my area on the back road, something jumped out in front of my friends. My current friend with them said it was lanky, tall, running on all fours with pale skin. She didn't see the features in detail as Mal swerved to miss it and floored it out of there. Later that night, they all cleansed their rooms before bed. The next story is one my grandmother told me. I call her my mom because she raised me. Now, my grandmother is an evangelical Christian, a strict one at that. She doesn't believe our house is haunted or cursed in any way, and she's a firm believer that this house is blessed, despite all the things that have happened to her in it. This might have changed that. It was late, nearing November of 2021, just at the tail end of October. Important to note, my sleep schedule is not the best. Needless to say, and I quote from one of my favorite streamers, usually my sleep schedule gets destroyed and it like alternates every week. So this was why I didn't see this, but she did. One morning, my grandmother, aka mom, asked me if anything strange happened the night before. I was only up to about 11 p.m., but I do remember something happening. Knocking sounds at the door, three times. My brother heard it too and looked at me wide-eyed in terror. There shouldn't have been anyone at the door at that time. My sister was already home and it was late. Then there were three more knocks after that, and we just stared at the door. I am superstitious as it is, and according to stories... Three knocks mean something wants to be let inside. I steeled myself and said firmly, You're not welcome inside. And after that, no more knocking. I shrugged it off but told mom we heard knocking last night while she slept. She stared at me, saying, Something strange happened to me early in the morning. The sun near our house doesn't fully illuminate things until after 7, but just before 5.30, you can see shapes and outlines well enough. She told me she was sitting near the living room window, looking outside like she always does, across the field, when something bright began to fall from the sky. She said it was like an orb of fire, and fell into the field, hovering, before darting to her. It took my mom a moment to react, and in the time she thought to react, it just vanished into thin air. No trace of it at all. It spooked her. She wasn't sure what it was but I told her strange things have always happened around here. She just stared at me, and I left as my stepdad talked with her about some things he knew. Bigfoot is a shapeshifter. From C.J. Mullins. I'm no writer, but I'll do my best to describe what I saw. I live on a mountain in West Virginia, only three households live up here. All of us retired, and between us, we own just over 20 acres. Our property borders the summit, a 10,600 acre property owned by the Boy Scouts, and that property borders 70,000 plus acres of maintained, preserved wilderness. Naturally, there's a lot of wildlife in this area. My husband has chickens, and because he likes to keep tabs on what might be messing with them, he keeps a trail cam posted near the coop. We see raccoons, foxes, we've seen a bobcat, a mountain lion too. DNR will tell you West Virginia doesn't have them, but we do. I saw one last summer running across my yard. We've seen a lot of coyotes on it, and every so often a bear. Now, the layout of the property is important. The three households own a lot of land, but our homes are situated in sort of an upside-down triangle from my point of view. The neighbor at the top left of the triangle has his home situated far back from the entrance of his gate, and I've never seen any source of light coming from there at night. The neighbor at the top right and up a slight hill has a dusk to dawn light, and we at the bottom point of the triangle have motion lights. When we built our house, we had an attached garage, but later my husband decided we needed a three-car garage behind the house. He's a retired carpenter and gets bored, so he invents things to build. I took full advantage of this and turned the attached garage into my craft room. Last Friday night, I was sitting in my craft room doing my thing. I like to listen to YouTube videos while I work, so I was picking out a playlist on my iPad. It was about 10.30 at night, 
very dark out, and I had the garage door up because it was warm. The only light was the light spilling out of my garage, and a bit of my neighbor's dusk to dawn light, which from my viewpoint only lightly illuminated part of the drive leading up the hill. My nine-year-old beagle was sleeping on the floor next to me when he began to growl. We've had him since he was six weeks old, so I've heard him growl before, but never like this. I looked down at him, and then in the direction he was looking. It was standing in the middle of my neighbor's driveway, about halfway up the hill. I instantly knew that it wasn't a man. It was, I would guess, about seven and a half feet tall. I'm bad at that, but that's my best guess. The thing was standing on two legs, and due to the dim light, I couldn't tell if it was facing me or facing the other way. I know bears can stand up. I've never seen one do it in person, but I know they can do that. But this thing didn't look like a bear to me. It wasn't really fat enough, I guess. It was bulky, but not fatty like a bear. I then realized I was on full display under the bright lights in that garage, so I took four steps to hit the light switch. When I stood up, though, it moved. It didn't run, but walked rapidly. It did look like a man walking, but again, this was not a man. I stood frozen, focusing my eyes on the area it went in. It walked into the wooded area between the two points of the triangle between my neighbor's drives. I don't think its fur was black. I got the impression it was a dark brown. Once my eyes adjusted, I could see a shadowy shape in the wooded area. Then I saw it go from a dark color to a lighter one, and for a split second, I mean, if I had blinked, I would have missed it, I saw the shape of its head and shoulder area change. It wasn't like the American werewolf in London, slow and painful looking, but it happened extremely fast. It then dropped down, and a few seconds later, the biggest coyote I've ever seen walked out of the area, stopped, looked straight at me, then trotted off into the woods to the left. I know, if a coyote had been in the patch of woods, it would have ran out when that thing ran in there. I also know that I saw that thing change. I never believed in shapeshifters. I thought it was just scary stories kids told each other. As far as Bigfoot, I've never had an opinion. I like to believe in him, but didn't ever expect to see one. And I also don't drink or do drugs. I know what I saw that night. I just can't wrap my mind around it. I had my husband check his trail cam, but that thing didn't come near it. I had my cell phone lying next to me on the table at the time, but all of this happened so fast, I didn't have time to try to get a shot of it. Then again, I don't think it would have picked up anything. It was just too dark for a phone camera. If I'd thought to grab it when it was in the middle of the drive with the dim light behind it, I may have gotten a shot of its form, but I just didn't think of that in the moment. Not all legends are fiction. From KK. Let me start by saying most people aren't going to believe this, but this is my memory of it. My husband and I went to visit my mother for Thanksgiving. She lives on top of a mountain on several acres of national forest. Basically, you wind all the way to the top, take a turn on a barely drivable road, punched right through the woods. She spent years building a beautiful cabin where she resides still today. It's like nothing you can describe, really, except one simple thing, isolation. There aren't too many folks up on the mountain, and they like it that way. This is why I'm not throwing out a location. And yes, I know it's convenient, and for some it will be frustrating, but I'd rather keep it private. At any rate, we absolutely loved spending holidays out there, as you can imagine. On this particular occasion, it was November of 2010. We had built a campfire and were sitting around enjoying the sounds of the woods and telling stories. My mother looks up and says, The craziest thing happened here recently. My neighbor called me and asked me to come over. She had something to show me, so when I went over to my neighbor, she tells me, So this morning I went to check on my deer cams. One of my cams was completely destroyed. The cam was in pieces, but I managed to get the SD card. The first picture was of a huge buck. The second picture... Well, I got this. As my mom explained the story, she told us what was in that picture, or at least what she saw. 
My mom said it was some sort of animal. It was extremely pale with long arms and legs. She said it looked like the flash of the deer cam made its eyes light up too. The creature appeared to not even have a nose. She went on to say, So after that, the neighbor obviously freaked out, took the photo to the local police. They supposedly laughed in her face and said it was fake. Not long after, the people in town started to talk. They made remarks about her being crazy and a hoaxer. So then she sends it to the state government. I'm not kidding you. And they told her it was a hoax too. By this time, she was getting so much crap about it. She just stopped talking about it altogether. My mom then went on to explain that the last she'd ever heard of it was that the neighbor gave the SD card to her drunk son-in-law. At that point, my husband and I are like, holy crap, no way. Then my detective brain kicked in. So I grabbed my MacBook and made a Google search and came up with a certain picture. I showed it to my mom and she said, oh my God, that's the same thing. I did some more research and from what I can figure, the SD card was sent to a news station anonymously. I'm thinking that was the son-in-law who did it. Now for those who may not have heard, and to those who may have already guessed, I'm talking about something that looks like the rake. Now for the record, I'm not saying the rake is real, but I am saying this story is real. I'm saying that the photo is real. That as far as I believe, it was not photoshopped or faked. It was taken on a real cam in the middle of the night in the middle of hundreds of acres of national forest. Also, my mom has lived there for 20 years and has never seen anything like this. So you decide for yourself. Do you think things like the rake or crawlers exist? Mountain Hiking Monster from Dog Lover 2002 I'm a 19-year-old female and I love hiking especially when I need a pick-me-up. Well, in August of last year, my friend Gia and I went hiking. I brought my dogs, Bane, a three-year-old Bernese mountain dog, and Clocker, a nine-month-old Cocker Spaniel. We would be hiking through the Wichita Mountains. We made sure to bring our coats just in case it got cold. About seven minutes into our hike, I get this feeling that we're being watched. Gia sees the look on my face and asks, Rainy, are you okay? I get ready to say something in response. When we heard this rustling noise, Bane and Clocker began to growl. Gia, throwing caution to the wind, said, Hey, who's there? That's when this tall creature walked onto the trail in front of us. The dogs went crazy. The thing looked half man, half goat. We stood there in shock until the creature began running towards us. We turned around and ran down the trail with the dogs. Bane and Clocker beat us to the car. We hopped inside and sped away. I still have no idea what we saw, but we don't go hiking anymore. Gia was too scared to live on her own after that encounter, so she moved in with me. Clocker has gotten more brave and Bane growls at every single goat or lamb he sees, except for my goat, Lucky, who Bane grew up with. I ended up telling another friend of mine named Andre about the experience, and the first thing he said was, probably a goat man. The Thing in West Virginia From Tim Roger This story occurred in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Even though I was originally born in Charleston, I moved to Parkersburg when I was three. I was raised in an isolated area in the mountains. West Virginia is known for its scary cryptids and the well-known Mothman. But I'm here to tell you about a new type of creature, one never seen by the human eye before, at least as far as I know. I was eight years old, playing outside with my German Shepherd. I vividly remember it being a nice fall day. The trees were beginning to lose their leaves, Every step, I could hear the leaves crunching below me. As I mentioned, I live in an isolated area in the mountains, so my family would have to drive about 30 minutes to town if they wanted groceries or just to take me to school. It was evening, so I was bored, just running around throwing sticks as my dog attempted to go get them. I always loved the outdoors from a young age, but this event almost changed it for me. I soon noticed a stream heading down the mountain. I went over to it and my dog followed. 
I sat down on a nearby rock and looked up. I could tell it was going to be dark soon. That's when I heard a twig snap on the other side of the stream. I looked over to see a small squirrel just looking at me. My dog barked and foolishly ran across the stream, splashing me in the process. I ran after him, but soon lost him. I looked around and soon found that I was indeed lost. I had an uneasy feeling and just wanted to be back home. I tried to retrace my steps, but I couldn't seem to find my way back. Every second that passed, that uneasy feeling would multiply. I scanned my surroundings until I found what was giving me that feeling. To this day, I still regret looking in that direction. What I saw was eight feet tall. It was skinny and had a weird face like that of a bear, but it definitely wasn't a bear. This creature had patches of brown fur, but it looked like it had gotten in a fight with something. It had long arms, and that stench that came off it was insane. I stumbled backwards, and I was just in shock. It seemed like the thing was just as scared as I was. It went down on four legs and scurried off. It sure did remind me of a grizzly bear, but I'm not sure we have grizzly bears in West Virginia. Only black bears, I believe. And if it was a grizzly bear, why would it act like that? The thing I encountered made no noise. It was silent. I just sat there pondering on what I saw. I finally got the nerve to get up, but my legs were so shaky and I was so paranoid. I looked behind me every minute. I tried to run at one point, but I had no sense of direction. Even so, I just wanted to run and so I did anyway. Eventually, I reached a road. It was the same road that led to my house. I followed it. I made it almost halfway up the road and my heart sank as I remembered I didn't know where my dog went. I tried to think of an excuse and want to tell my parents, but what would they think? I walked into my house and went directly to my bedroom. I didn't come out that evening at all. Eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night with that same feeling and I swear, I heard something knocking at my window. I was petrified. I felt cold teardrops falling down my cheeks. I was so scared. The next day, my dog thankfully somehow found his way home. I was so relieved, but I could tell he wasn't the same. After that day, I haven't been in those same woods ever again. I've been too scared to, even now as I'm 38, I'm just too paranoid. I don't know what was messing with us. From Angel F. This took place in 2013 in Boulder, Colorado. I always think about this from time to time, and I never will understand what this thing was or why this happened. My boyfriend, now husband, and I wanted to go spend some time in the mountains. He invited another couple and his two brothers, and we left about one in the afternoon. We found the most random spot, then stopped to get out and cook some food. We weren't too deep in the woods because the road was literally right next to us. But if you looked around, there was nothing but trees everywhere and not very many cars passed by. My husband and his friend and one of his brothers decided to go exploring deeper in the woods. Me, his friend's girlfriend, and his younger brother stayed and chilled by the little fire we had going. We were enjoying ourselves when all of a sudden all three of the guys came running down the hill. They said they'd found a tent, but it was a weird makeshift one. There was garbage all around it and hair everywhere. My first thought was maybe this was someone's home and they have nowhere else to go, so they took refuge out here in the woods. The hair part was a little confusing, though. They also said it was weird because when they were there, they felt as if they were being watched, and the woods were unusually quiet. That's why they'd come back so fast. Mind you, they were only gone for about 10 minutes. I told him not to be messing around, and if this was a prank, it wasn't funny. He said they were serious and thought maybe it was time to go. We'd already been there a few hours by then. All of a sudden... We heard what sounded like a rock being thrown. It definitely wasn't close, as if someone was trying to hit us or the car, because it was still at a good distance. 
By then, it was already getting dark. I'm not too sure if my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I swore I saw some sort of shadow or something moving so fast between the trees. I yelled at my boyfriend to look, and every time he did, that thing seemed to move away. We started for the car, which was only a few steps away. We rushed in the car, looking around to see if we could see this thing again, but it never showed itself. I felt like the moment we all got in the car, this thing was going to come and attack us. I felt so scared, especially because I was the one who was driving, so I had to compose myself and hope for the best. We never saw what it was, for sure, but my husband said he thinks it was a Bigfoot, Honestly, I don't know, but it was definitely a moment I'll never forget. We never did go back there. White River Wendigo from Sea Philly 100 There have been quite a few Wendigo encounters being reported out of the Roosevelt National Forest here in Colorado as of late, so I thought I'd share my encounter as well. It was back in July of 2021. I was trying to get 50 or 55 days in before the 2020-2021 ski season ended. We can ski pretty much year-round here, save for a few late summer months, and looking back, I can't seem to recall whether it was 50 or 55. Anyway, I typically like to backcountry ski out on Loveland Pass, but seeing as how it was the middle of summer, mostly all the snow up there had already melted. I could see from the top of the pass, however, that there was still a solid strip of summer snow over on the west side of the pass, southeast of Arapaho Basin Ski Area, a couple of peaks down from Arapaho Basin's infamous East Wall, an area featuring such ominous route names as Crap for Brains, Idiots, and The Widowmaker, just to name a few. Inspirational, right? Well, I was the wise guy who was going to hike up a nearly vertical granite wall because I just had to hit that number. Funny how I can't even remember that number. Anyhow, I drove down to the pullout down below the ascent, put the car in park, and got out to relieve myself. Now, this particular area used to be part of the Arapaho National Forest, but it was transferred over to White River back in 1998. It's a wild area that provides significant habitat for deer, elk, mountain sheep, mountain goat, bear, and various other wildlife. It was already afternoon, which, generally speaking, is a no-no in the high mountains of Colorado in the summertime, or any time really, but especially in the summer, when lightning storms are an almost daily occurrence in the afternoons up there, and it was already clouding over by that time. But this was my final chance to get in before a big trip I had scheduled, so I strapped up my boots, threw my skis over my shoulder, and got to stepping. The first part of the hike was difficult. I had to make my way through some pretty thick brush just to get up into the woods, and once I got into the woods, I realized it would be easier to follow what's known as an AV track, which is basically what's left over after an avalanche slides down a natural gravitational fall line. Avalanche paths are subdivided into three sections, the start zone, the track, and the runout zone. So I was hiking up the talus path, stepping from stone to stone almost like a natural staircase. I was stopping every couple of yards to transfer my skis from one shoulder to the other. At some point, the avalanche path turned into a high mountain stream. Mind you, this is right around 12,000 plus feet above sea level at this point in the ascent. Right around the trigger zone of the AV path, I was able to exit the talus path and start making my way up the high alpine section of the ascent. This was just a bit above treeline, where the mountain breaks up into big gullies and steep cliffed out ravines. There are some high mountain caves up there, some natural and some old gold and silver mines, the latter of which the nearby town of Silverthorne was named after. I'd never been so close to these particular caves before, and I noticed that there were quite a few bones scattered about. Either deer or mountain goats, I'm not really sure. But what startled me was that some still appeared to be fairly fresh, with flies buzzing about and feasting on the little bits of rotting flesh still stuck to the bones. I figured there must be a mountain lion den nearby, as they are a pretty common sight around the area. I wasn't too concerned, though, as I had my skis to protect me, 
and mountain lions aren't really known to be super aggressive unless you provoke them. The thing that puzzled me, however, was the smell. Mountain lions smell like big cats. They have that same strong ammonia smell to their urine, which they use to mark their territory, so you'll smell it when they're spooked. This, on the other hand, was more like a dead, rotten flesh smell, and I'm not just talking about the little bits of flesh the flies were feasting on, more like a dead rooster that's been left out for months to bake in the hot summer sun. Believe me, I would know. I used to live on a free-range chicken farm out on Orcas Island, but that's a different story. No, this was like the kind of smell that makes you want to throw up. Very vile. Disgusting. Just then I started to hear what sounded like a chicken squawking, only differently. More hoarse and raspy, like a chicken dying from emphysema, if that makes any sense at all. My spidey senses were tingling as I quickly assessed that there's no way in heck a chicken had managed to get all the way up here. This was far away from civilization. The squawking turned into more of a high-pitched whistling sound, but with the sound waves bouncing off the rocks and echoing around the gully, so I couldn't quite tell where it was coming from. That almost made it sound like it was all around me. Feeling nauseated and a bit disoriented, I then heard a loud popping sound and turned around just in time to see something truly horrific. A giant, moose-like creature with sharp, curvy antlers and a face and head like a big elk skull or something, with black, soulless pits for eyes, two small slits where the nose should be, and complete with long, jagged teeth hanging out of its bony, downward mouth, if you could call it that. A skeletal but muscular and rather mangy-looking ribcage, and I could see that it was hunched over on its haunches that looked like oversized deer legs, with the long, extended heel ending in rather large hooves. It had long, skinny arms that it was using to halfway run, walk, and lunge at me in a jerky and uncoordinated fashion, yet it was somehow still impossibly fast and aggressive. It was rapidly crossing the clearing in a disturbed and menacing manner. Not having much time to react, I quickly threw my skis down on the ground and clipped in, and even though there wasn't quite enough snow to ski on, off I went, bouncing down the hill, cranking over rocks and patches of grassy dirt, just praying that I didn't fall. I could hear that thing chasing me, and I knew I couldn't turn around, but I could hear its heavy bipedal footfall behind me, and I could see from our shadows that the thing was gaining on me. There was a big cliff coming up, and I knew I had to take my chances or this thing was going to catch me. Just then, I saw its two long, sinewy arms, ending in long, black claws that looked like they were stained with layers of old, caked-up blood, reaching out around my waist. I shut my eyes and tried to scream, but nothing came out. When I opened my eyes, I was flying through the air, my stomach in my throat, like when you're on a roller coaster. And just like that, boom, I hit the ground. My skis went flying off into the stream, with me tumbling down behind them. It was all I could do to keep my hands out in front of my face, cartwheeling down the mountain, slicing my arms and legs open against the razor-sharp rocks. It's truly a miracle that I didn't hit my head or break any bones in the process. But then my leg got jammed up in between the rocks and a big patch of ice, stopping my fall. I could no longer see the thing, but I knew I had to keep moving, so I pulled my leg out and grimaced in pain before sliding down the ice field and popping out into the trees below. I hoisted myself up against a tree and started to limp down, pushing it for all I was worth, finally reaching the scrubby bush below. From way up on the mountain, I heard the most grotesque and blood-chilling scream. It sounded like a demonic dragon from the movies or something. You can bet I scrambled as fast as my aching body would allow getting back to my car. When I finally made it to my car, I jumped in and I threw it in reverse, backing out onto US-6 before throwing it into gear and hauling my sorry tail out of there. I think my adrenaline began to wear off at that point, because I could feel myself shaking uncontrollably and I had to pull over to vomit. My wounds were oozing blood and I knew I had to tend to them before they became infected. I drove down to the nearest gas station and went into the bathroom to wash my cuts. When I came out, 
The gas station attendant was looking at me like, what the heck, bro? Trust me, I said. You don't want to know. Devil's Racetrack Werewolf From Skater 91 In 2013, I lived close to a hiking trail. I would build a fire in a fire pit there and hang out on cool nights with a neighbor. On two separate occasions, we heard coyotes barking and howling like they were killing prey, only to hear this eerie quietness, followed by a loud howl, which was much more deep than a wolf howl. It sent chills down my spine. A couple of months later, I moved a few miles away to an apartment with my girlfriend. I was sitting in my apartment with a couple of friends one night. My girlfriend wasn't home at the time. One of them mentioned going for a hike, so we went out. We stopped by our local Walmart to pick up a few things and headed out to the trails. We walked about a mile or so up before settling down and building a fire. I helped get the fire going and went to gather some wood. That's when I saw something. I believed it to be the same creature that made those weird howls. We were face to face. It was climbing up the rocky side of the mountain and stared into my eyes. This creature was eight feet tall with human-like hands and claw-like nails. Its upper body was like that of a man, but its head was wolf-like and its legs were dog-like. Its eyes had a red glint to them, and strangely it looked more human than anything. Its fur was as dark as death. The creature snarled, and I ran for my life back to the campfire. When I told my friends, one of them believed me, but the other thought I was crazy. We left shortly after I begged to leave. On the hike back, I think it followed us all the way out, like it was territorial over the mountainside. I never returned there after dark. Pale Gray Humanoid Encounter in the Wyoming Rockies From Sea Philly 100 This story was told to me by my friend, but it's pretty wild, so I thought I'd share it here, told from his perspective. I was camping in the Wind River Range in Wyoming, which is coincidentally the highest range in the state. I was getting ready to go to sleep in my car at the trailhead when I saw SAR leaving. They let me know they'd been searching for a hiker who had been reported missing for 24 hours. They said they had to turn back now though, due to a big winter storm system moving through the area. Before leaving, they said they'd be back in the morning, but to be on the lookout. I said I would but my hopes were rather low for his survival at this point in time. I set out bright and early the next morning. It had snowed about a foot overnight. My objective was Mount Gannett, which is the tallest peak in the Wind River Range, at 13,804 feet or so. I had my snowshoes on, but it was still rather slow going. I was taking in the natural beauty and enjoying myself when I noticed some fresh tracks in the snow. These were human. They were plowing straight through the trees and bushes and everything else in a straight line. Thinking it might be the missing hiker, I decided to follow them. I'd only gone about 400 yards or so when I thought I heard a familiar sound. It sounded like a baby crying. My human instinct took over and I started in the direction from whence I'd heard the sound. What struck me as odd, however, was that the pitch never changed. It sounded almost like a recording of a baby crying played on a loop or something. I looked up just in time to see something dart behind a tree. I became a bit confused at that point, as I could no longer hear the baby crying, and I wasn't entirely sure what I was doing there anymore. I went to turn around, when something once again caught my eye. Something stepped out from behind a tree, it looked like a pale humanoid creature. The best thing I can think to compare it to would be that white orc from the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit series, although it didn't look exactly like that. The face was similar. No nose and this look of total hatred and malice. It had this sinister grin on its face that seemed to say, that's it, 
I've got you. It was about six or seven feet tall and extremely muscular. It didn't appear to have any hair or male or female parts. It began to walk through the snow, seemingly without any resistance at all. It never broke direct eye contact with me. The only motion seemed to be a slight bobbing up and down. Other than that, it was very intentional with its movements. I started stumbling backwards, tripping over my snowshoes in my attempt to turn around. I heard a gunshot then, looking up to see an SAR officer wielding a pump-action shotgun. The creature screamed like a banshee before leaping back out of sight, leaving a slight trail of thick dark blood in its path. The officer ran over, helping me to my feet. He radioed that he'd found someone in such and such part of the grid. We made our way back to the trailhead together. We were met by someone on a snowcat. The officer said he'd shot a bear that had been charging me. He looked at me, though, knowingly, and I figured I'd trust his intuition. I mean, who would believe there had been a tall, hairless, pale, white man out there preying on people? It turns out the other guy, who had actually been missing, had spent the night on the mountain, hunkered down in a hollow. He had made his way, albeit somewhat unorthodoxly, back down to the trailhead. I am immensely grateful to these volunteers, to whom I owe my life. To all of you listening or reading this, be careful if you're heading out into the Wyoming Rockies. There's something out there, and I have a feeling that shotgun didn't do much to slow it down. Cabin in the Rocky Mountains of Albuquerque From Anonymous I'm 50 years old and I've been seeing things you might find interesting since I was 11 or 12 years old. I'll start with one of my newer stories. So I used to live in the Manzano Rocky Mountains by Albuquerque with my black lab, in 2000 and 2001. It was a log cabin tongue and groove kit house. One side of the roof was asphalt shingles, the other side was cement shingles. I lived at the back corner of Cibola National Forest. It was very cold in the winter. Two degrees from November until April, four feet of snow. Even though I hate the cold, it was one of the neatest places I've ever lived. I bought a yardstick just to check the depth of the snow. When I dropped it in, it disappeared. I had to turn my head sideways and stick my arm in the snow to find it. This was just a clearing, not a snow drift like up against the house. I lived there for one year, and during my time there, something kept landing on the roof. Something big that sounded like it had claws. You could hear those claws crunching on the cement tiles. It made the house rattle. It was very heavy. I carried a 41 Magnum revolver pistol with me inside the house and out. It's an older caliber pistol, but more comfortable to shoot than a 44 Magnum, and more powerful than a 357 Magnum. I would often smoke outside. I had a deck back then that was 50 feet long. Now, sometimes I would hear that big, clawed thing land on the deck, and let me tell you, Whatever it was, it could cover all 50 feet of that deck in about four steps. Even if I exaggerated my own steps, I could not cover 50 feet in four steps. I'm six foot two, 220 pounds, and that thing was much bigger than me. On four different occasions, I almost blew a hole in the roof. I wanted to put a 210 grain bullet in it. One of my friends who came to visit every once in a while laughed at me when I told him about this. He said it was BS, but he wasn't laughing when it happened when he was here. He carried a 25 caliber pistol and almost blew a hole in the roof with me. I never actually did shoot through the roof. I was afraid the roof would slow the bullet down too much, and if it hit that thing, it would just tee it off. Then it could just reach around the roof and take me home as a sandwich. I never did actually see it. I'm glad I didn't. I was afraid it might give me nightmares for the rest of my life. Shapeshifter in the Mountains From Anonymous 
This crazy event took place in the Blue Ridge Mountain region of South Carolina at a fairly popular but very secluded campground right off of the Chattooga River. It all started when my mom and dad, along with their best friends, another married couple, Stacy and Stephen, decided to go spend the day on the river. To get to the river, you drive through a town a ways up the mountain and eventually go down a road that turns to gravel for a couple of miles with a parking lot at the end. Then you walk along a trail from the lot about a half mile to the river. There's a big rock everyone always chills on in the river, and that's where they decided to go for the day. Well, Stacy ends up getting trashed drunk from a cooler of beer she brought. She was a pretty big woman and liked to drink. She ends up jumping in the river and floating out of sight. It's about midday at this point, so my mom and dad and Stephen go looking for her. It takes them hours, but they end up finding her down the river assaulting some girl at a campsite in a drunken stupor. My mom gets her off of the girl and apologizes. The campers are chill and let them go. By this point, it's getting dark fast. Now, I don't know how they got separated, but they did. Stephen more or less had to drag Stacy back to the car at the lot, and my parents got left behind and were separated when it got dark. By some miracle, my dad crawled back to the gravel road through the forest and ran back into Stephen and Stacy, but my mom was left behind in the pitch black mountain forest. My dad yelled out for her and searched for a long time before he just started crawling out and he never found her. It's the middle of the night by then, and they know they couldn't find her in that kind of darkness, so they all came back to the house. Yeah, my mom got left miles in a forest in the parkway all night all alone. But as soon as we knew day would be breaking soon, we left the house to go looking. It was me, my dad, Stephen, and my good friend at the time, who happened to live with us. We'll call him Alex. We were heading up there in Stephen's Isuzu Trooper. Stephen was driving. Dad was in the front passenger seat. I was behind Dad in the back seat and Alex was beside me. We made it to the gravel road leading to the lot, and the sun was peeking in the trees now. We were on a good straightaway. Suddenly, we see something ahead on the side of the road shuffling around. It looks like a small possum-like creature. Maybe the size of a basketball. It has off-white fur, and it was kind of shaggy. We all had our windows down at the time. It was summer and it was pretty warm after all. Our little group was speculating on what it could be, but we assumed it was just some little forest critter. Nothing too striking, so we didn't think much of it. We were going maybe 15 miles per hour, and we came up to it about 20 yards away, and I'm looking right at it at this point as we approach. The next thing I know, right before my freaking eyes, this little ball of fur just kind of jumps and spins and morphs right before us into this fairly large anomaly of a creature. It was maybe three and a half feet tall and hunched with large padded feet and legs, similar to a kangaroo and a long hairless tail like a giant rat. Its body was fairly stocky with thin arms held tightly to its chest. But I could see little black hands with claws, and yes, I mean hands, not paws or anything like that. Not quite human, but hands with opposable appendages. Now the head was the freakiest. It was like a greyhound dog head with lots of tiny pearly teeth and a thin snout. But all its skin was black and its body had thick black matted fur. Yet the head had neatly kept dreadlocks bouncing off the top of its head between pointed ears and nearly hairless face. But like I said before, it was similar to a greyhound dog head in shape and size. This was the most bizarre thing I'd ever seen. I can't even explain how it made me feel, not evil, but supernatural, definitely intelligent. The whole scene was just surreal. It looked at all of us as it matched our speed. We all freaked out and gawked at it as it hopped beside the car. Oh yeah, it was definitely hopping, extremely fast. Steven sped up to about 50 miles per hour, 
but it just stayed beside us, seemingly effortlessly. It was on mine and my dad's side. I got a good look at it. Its eyes were like red beads, but glowing like an LED light in the day. It appeared to smile, showing teeth a little from its greasy snout. After maybe 15 to 20 seconds, it bounded in front of the car and disappeared into the forest, like a freaking kangaroo rat dog, whatever the heck it was. It was absolutely wild. After that, we were all in shock and awe and far more eager to find my mom. Stephen and Dad were tripping out by then. I was just like, holy crap, I couldn't believe what we saw. And Alex never said anything. He just had wide, confused eyes. Well, we found my mom later and all was well. She had hunkered down in a stump hole overnight with a shirt over her head. She was teed off for being left, understandably so. So yeah, me and three other perfectly sane men saw a small furry possum-like creature jump and morph into a monstrosity of a beast right before our eyes. And now, I believe in shapeshifters. To put the icing on the cake, I saw the darn thing a couple of weeks later right up the road from my house. My sister was with me in the car that night. She freaked out and told everyone else we told the story to that it was indeed real. I live almost an hour from the mountain spot where we first saw it, and it was in the large hoppy rat thing form when it bounced beside me on my way home that night two weeks later. My sister was petrified and says she will never forget that and how it looked. She described it identically to how I saw it. So I guess it followed us home. Maybe, I don't know, but it freaks me the heck out. That's my story. Believe it or not, it's true. We don't know what all is hiding out there in the world. But whatever that was, me and four other people have now witnessed it. Be safe, especially out in the mountains and the wilderness. Thankfully, the thing wasn't aggressive so far, but it certainly looked like it could do some damage if it wanted to. Take heed to the unknown. Thunderbird Encounter in the Rocky Mountains from James M. W. I was born and lived most of my life in Ohio, but moved to Colorado at 12. I should say that I do believe in the supernatural and paranormal. I currently live with my mother and stepfather, and the house my father owns has the ghost of one of his friends in it, we believe. He passed away in the home around five years ago. Well, seven years ago, my family and I were homeless, and we were staying in a broke-down RV on land in the Rocky Mountains that belongs to a family friend. Now, being that I was 13 at the time and in love with the nature, I went out into the woods and rock faces behind the RV all the time, and I loved to find different animals that I've never seen before. I found different lizards and even almost became dinner for a bobcat once, but that was nothing compared to what I bumped into a few weeks later. Now, I'm not full-blood native, I only have a little bit in me. However, through my years of research, I'm 19 now, there's only one being that it could have been that I saw, and I'm not sure if it was good or bad. I just can't find out exactly on the internet what it truly means to encounter a thunderbird. Anyway, it happened a few weeks after I had a brush with a bobcat. I was exploring the land my family and I lived on, I found an old wood building in the forest with some old tools on the broken down floor. Now, this was one of the few times that I went off exploring without my older brother, so I knew I was the only one out there at the time in those woods. That day, I didn't hear any animal noises at all. No birds, no bugs, nothing. The hunters out there listening or reading, you might say that this means that there's a wolf, bobcat, or a bear around, but this was different. It was beyond the normal silence. Now that I think of it, I remember hearing small animals in the old building when I first went in. Bugs, rats, a few snakes even. But then they all just stopped, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. It was around 11am, so the sun was bright in the sky. 
I've got good eyes, so I would have known if it was a normal animal I saw when I opened the door to this old building. Somehow sitting in a tree about 20 feet away from me, staring down at me for about 10 to 15 seconds, was a giant bird. At 13, I was 5 foot 11, so I wasn't a small kid. This bird was twice my size easily, with a wingspan that was well over 13 feet if not much bigger. The animal itself was jet black, no other color at all, as if it were a shadow or something. I stood there for what felt like forever, just staring up at this being, and as it looked at me dead in the eyes, all I could do was just stand there. I didn't feel fear or dread or anything like that. It was more that I didn't want to move. I didn't understand what I was seeing. Now, in case of emergencies, I did always carry a large 13-inch bowie knife on my hip. But I know that if this thing wanted to, there would be nothing I could do to stop it from killing me right then and right there. And by the time I realized what it might have been, it just opened its wings and flew away. All these years later, I now work at a factory, and during the night shift, sometimes I'll see a shadow of a large bird much bigger than me. The current largest living bird in the world, Diomedea exelons, or wandering albatross. It has a wingspan of 12 feet, but this is an island bird, and it's white, so I know it wasn't a known animal or whatever wording you'd use. This was something rare something beyond belief. To this day, I'm not sure what it actually was, but the only thing I can think of is Thunderbird. Now believe what you want and say what you'd like, but this did actually happen. That brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. More terrifying stories are on the way soon, so subscribe and smash that like button. By the way, did you know this show is available as a podcast called Unexplained Encounters? Just search for, follow, and rate Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. This show is part of the EerieCast network. Go to EerieCast.com for more scary podcasts, such as Freaky Folklore, which explores your favorite monsters, myths, and mysteries as well as Redwood Bureau, a fictional horror podcast about an agent on the run from an evil secret organization that captures supernatural creatures and entities. Well, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one. <laughs>